Hello there, my friends. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 762. That's Siete Seis Dos of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely, stupid, nice, clean, safe, emotionally well-balanced, stable, mature podcast may find you. I hope you are doing well wherever this lovely, brilliant, amazing, stupendous, this podcast may find you i hope i really do pray i really do scream into the air that you're doing well that you're doing fine that you're happy that you're lubricated that you're hydrated that you are nice and limber and ready to hear some of my sultry effervescent omnipresent tones cool how have I been? Pretty good as you can tell, pretty good as you can tell. Things are only up and up for me. Um, always have been, always will be, never will be the same. So I'm very, very happy about that. I'm living life, I'm feeling gracious. It is what it blood clot is with me. I cannot complain. Um today's been a bit of a mad one because I've suddenly realized there's a distinct possibility, a very distinct possibility that Arsenal could win the league. And I wouldn't have any complaints about that. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to have any complaints about that. I'm not going to lie. I swear to God. I swear to God I won't have any complaints about that. Because the way that they dispatched Brighton today, the way they absolutely duppied Brighton and put them to the sword expertly, you know, Deserby, one of the most, I guess, revered and held managers in the league, um, you know, a team full of really talented technical players coming up, another team with good te technical, technical players. It's just, it was just night and day, the quality. And you have to kind of, you know, tip your hat at them, especially the second goal, the Kai Havertz goal absolutely stupid and now you have the distinct possibility that Arsenal with one of the most annoying one of the most infuriating fan bases in the history of football could actually win the league ahead of Liverpool and Man City I think if Arsenal win the league this time it will be more impressive than the league that they bottled last season I swear to God coming up against the caliber of opposition they have now with City on the run that they're on, with Liverpool kind of purring a little bit, a little bit here and there, hit and miss, I know, but still kind of purring, this being Klopp's final season at Liverpool. If Arsenal do manage to win the league ahead of those two teams, they deserved it. More so than more so than any other league they put, probably could have won in past years, especially more so than the one last year. Um, that second goal was crazy. Um, from time they've got Kai Havertz going tapping goals, that's when you know Arsenal are playing good. From time they got Kai Havertz. Kai Havertz, a serial underperformer, a serial misser of chances. He's now, I think, I saw a stat that said he has like scored nine goals in eleven games or something stupid like that. So clearly, they are playing at such a level that they can sometimes carry the players who you know sometimes let them down for lack of a better term and it's it's pretty sick I'm not gonna lie it's pretty flipping sick to see so big up Arsenal um well it well deserved I think for how patient they've been with their rebuild they haven't done what United have done they haven't just tried to rush things um they knew it was going to take a while it took a while they were patient with their guy they saw evidence of obviously good stuff good football was there I think that's something that we're missing as United fans we've seen no real evidence of good football even when our, our full strength team is out so this idea that you know Ayrton Hawk should get unlimited time is something that I obviously don't agree with but God almighty man you have to give kudos to flipping Arsenal and what they're doing now they're playing really well so I am really happy for them in that respect um, and if, again if I you know if I had to pick one team to win it out of Liverpool Man City and Arsenal it would probably be Arsenal even though when Man City win it it doesn't really matter for the grand scheme of things because you know it's Man City who really gives a fuck but it's still our local rivals Liverpool when they win it it's fucking you know it's too much to handle um, especially with the media being on their side and their their fans are probably at more 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 exhausting or more flipping agitating to kind of listen to than Arsenal fans. But Arsenal, considering the run they've been on, trophy list and shit, especially in the league, and then considering just the rebuild they've been doing, they probably are more deserving of that league title than anybody else. So big up them, big up them. Um, so let's move on. We've got many things to talk about today. So many things to crack on with. So I don't want to waste any more of your time. And we're just going to jump right into it. We're going to jump right into it with no lube and go flipping crazy. First thing I was thinking about randomly today, you know, I was thinking about that kind of came through my head or burst through the other side of my head, burst through my flipping eardrums. You know, what I was thinking about bitch, you guessed it. Black Lives Matter. I think Black Lives Matter for me was an inflection point because that is when I realized more so than ever 
that I was not like other girls. You know that whole pick me saying? Not like the other girls, right? I realised I was not like the other girls when Black Lives Matter was a thing because I wasn't even that politically um, active. I wasn't that politically knowledgeable. I wasn't that societally active or knowledgeable in any way, shape or form. I was just kind of doing my own thing. But even I could smell the scam. Even I could smell the grift. Even I could smell the nonsense from a mile away. I honestly could. And even though Black Lives Matter was more so an African-American thing that kind of you know spread worldwide, I still saw that this was this wasn't done for the best of intentions. It was definitely done to line somebody's pockets by, you know, um, um, what you call it, flying the flag of victimhood. And when everybody was banding around it, using the Black Lives Matter hashtag, using the BLM hashtag, doing the whole black squares nonsense, you remember that? Blackout Tuesday, do you fucking remember that shit? I knew... I knew that I was different because I never, ever agreed with this shit. I thought this stuff was absolutely nonsense. If anything, the thing that annoyed me the most about it is that I thought to myself, this isn't going to create the change that they say they want. Because in my head, I was thinking to myself, I've watched so many horrible, distressing, really sad police um, incompetence, police brutality, um, police basically murder videos that I know now for the amount of videos that I've watched, it's not just a racism thing. It's just an institutional thing. Like the police force, especially around the world, if there's a video going around at the moment of a police um, officers in Spain, you know, beating the living shits out of some African dude on the street, but it happens to everybody. Police around the world are fucking awful for the most part, especially in places in Western Europe. So I always thought having a message being put behind like a very racially charged slogan like Black Lives Matter wouldn't get the job done because to get the job done you need to make sure that everybody is aware that police brutality and police incompetence police murder um police just like not able to do their job properly and not be able to handle humans in the right way is something that affects everybody across the board we all have a situation or we could all can recall a moment with our family and friends where they've suffered of the hands of you know very overzealous police security guard whatever it may be people didn't want to hear that right they just want to hear the whole victimhood complex they want to band around the whole black lives matter thing nonsense obviously the term itself then got co-opted it made other people mad it, it then started the white lives matter trend as well that became a thing and it just completely devalued and took it away and then of course later on we found out that the founders or the people that originally set up the black lives matter charity over there in, Amer um, Af in, in america sorry these african-american people ended up just taking all the money for themselves or taking a majority of the money for themselves and buying themselves lavish things like houses and cars and all this fucking malarkey absolutely insane but i think as outside of this because this is a picture on the screen now of a pair of nike air jordan ones with the strap on it that says uh, black lives matter i think it's nike air jordan ones i'm not too sure if they're jordan ones if they're airships but whatever sh or maybe they're vandals whatever shoe they are they've got like a strap on the top i think they should be air force ones i think so I, I wish i knew my knowledge of fucking shoes from down below but anyway they're a black type pair of jordans this person's wearing and allegedly did this person's um a member of Jordan brand. I forgot his name. Something Cook. He's like an energy marketing guy over there. So clearly these are the things that I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate they never released these things. It was just something that he probably did for himself behind the scenes just to kind of rock whatever it may be. But this wasn't the worst. The worst definitely was a Blackout Tuesday thing. Because I remember during Blackout Tuesday where everyone had to kind of put these dumb squares on their fucking profile to show that they, you know, weren't racist. I legitimately remember this time I received DMs I receive DMs from friends, friends that I care about, friends that I rate, people that I know, people that I like, people who are reasonable, D in distress, asking me, hey, Agostino, what do you think about this Blackout Tuesday thing, man? I'm worried if I don't put it up, people, like, actually, what, like, actually, obviously, messaging me because I'm fucking black, number one, but still messaging me out of, like, pure concern, like, hey, if I don't do this thing, Will you look at me differently? Will I be looked at differently? Would I, would I be on the wrong side of history? Am I going to be looked at as fucking Stalin if I don't put this square on my profile? Blah, blah, blah. What's it like? I was like, oh my God, this shit has broken our brains. When reasonable people who have, who are deemed to be reasonable, people who are deemed to be rational, people who are deemed to be balanced, are very much worried that if they don't put a stupid black square on their Instagram profile, somehow people are going to think they're fucking Adolf Hitler. Absolutely insane. And we all lived through that. It was absolutely crazy, but we lived through it. And I, and I, like I said before in the beginning, I legitimately think this was the moment when I realized I wasn't like other girls. 
But then I also realized I wasn't really on the whole grifter wind up merchant thing because I wasn't exactly screaming it at the rooftops that, oh, you are all idiots. How are you doing this shit? This is a dumb thing. I just kind of kept it to myself and kept it moving. But at the time, I never took part in it, in anything, whether it came to the Black Lives Matter hashtag thing, whether it came to the fucking black squares, whether it came to the clapping on the outside for the fucking NHS. I didn't partake in any of that nonsense. I thought it was all gay. I thought it was all lame. I thought it was all fucking stupid. I thought it all wasn't going to do anything for anything that they thought it was going to do for. And if anything, it will all just kind of, if anything, um, capitalize on our collective fear. We were all worried for the future. We all didn't know whether or not the world was going to reopen again. If it was going to reopen, was it going to be the same world that we left in 2019? And we were all kind of in a bit of a weird place. And all this shit was meant to kind of comfort us. It didn't comfort me. If anything, it made me realise that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that love being victims. There's a lot of people out there that without racism, you know, without institutional racism, without white supremacy, they don't really have anything to say. They don't really have anything to contribute. All they contribute on is the fear is the lack of cooperation, is a lack of unity, is lack of love amongst people. That's what they actually want. They actually want us to be more divided so that we don't come together, so that we don't rid ourselves from the scourge of racism, the scourge of xenophobia, the scourge of whatever else, homophobia, whatever else it may be in this world to discriminate and to kind of isolate and kind of keep us separate. Because one thing that we realised during COVID, ironically enough, one thing we realised during COVID and during lockdown is that we're more different than we're alike the majority of us obviously the one top one percenters out there they were able to continue their lives without any real interruption you listen to joe rogan today joe rogan had um andrew schultz on and he was talking about how he set up the comedy mothership and essentially the comedy mothership came as the, from what he said off the back of frustration with la because he felt like his career in stand-up was being stifled because la was one of the strictest states out there or california was one of the strictest states out there in not allowing people to you know open up hospitality you know in hospitality air venues weren't allowed to open up bars and clubs and whatever weren't allowed to operate as per normal and i think that um joe rogan said in that podcast that even um california even got to a point where they were stopping people from doing outdoor shows because outdoor shows are the way to get around some of the whole um lockdown measures and stuff but even outdoor shows are being you know ruled out so joe rogan had the funds or had the means to basically move his family to another state in texas and then try and open a comedy club out there because the rules and regulations and restrictions there were far looser and far more relaxed than they were in california then he sets up the comedy mothership it opens and then he sets out for it to become the best comedy club in the world and obviously with his name and notoriety and the way he's kind of you know done things it's probably on his way to be in there but he was able to do that because he's in the top 1%. He's got fucking money. He's got more money than he could probably spend in a lifetime. So he could kind of do that. But the majority of us couldn't. We didn't have the ability to just kind of like decide that we didn't want to partake in the world and what it was going on. We just wanted to do our own thing. We couldn't. We had to wait for, you know, restrictions to be loosened. We had to wait to get vaccinated. We had to wait to get a stamp, a card, whatever maybe. We couldn't just do things we wanted to. So we realized we we're more alike than we weren't. But the powers that be probably saw that. I thought, you know what? We can't have these people realizing there's more, they have more in common than they have different. We have to kind of ramp up the fucking hostility, rank up the segregation, rank up the fucking differences and all that shit. And that's where we are in situation now. So if anything, all of these initiatives, as uh, even though they try to purport to be, you know, helping minorities and helping people, if anything, what they did is they, they, they went on to sow more division. Black Lives Matter, Blackout Tuesday, all that shit went, went on to sow more division because if you weren't for this, if you didn't agree to it, suddenly you were a racist suddenly you weren't an ally suddenly you were anti-black like come on bro come on because you didn't want to put a hashtag at the end of your tweet because you didn't want to put a black square on a lame black square on your fucking feed do me a favor have a little jog and sayonara saya bloody nara next talking about black stuff or black and white stuff i recently finished watching ripley on netflix and um I think it's incredibly, incredibly overrated. I'm not going to lie. I think because it's filmed in black and white and because we don't really have much, you know, stuff that looks like this on TV nowadays in terms of cinematography, in terms of direction, in terms of production, in terms of some of the dialogue, whatever, people are kind of raving it a bit much, but I didn't think it was that good. I'm not going to lie. I really didn't think it was that good. I thought it was quite boring in parts. I thought it dragged on unnecessarily. Um, I thought the characters... Um, 
all of them basically without any exempt were just all really deplorable and you didn't really you know you couldn't really get behind any of them in the real in the story itself to be honest personally for me i couldn't really get behind any of them um you didn't really want them anyone to win even the victims you didn't want to, even the quote unquote victims you didn't want anyone to kind of get their just deserves and you're just waiting for it to kind of be over and kind of see what the ending was all about but I really didn't enjoy it I'm not going to lie I really did think it was immensely overrated and it's weird because if you check the reviews I'm going to read one review here courtesy of Variety they've been lauding it they've been sucking it off super hard I saw one place gave it five stars the best thing on TV ever or something as a byline I'm like come on bros you guys need to chill the fuck out so let me see this this goes to a variety. It said, Andrew Scott's utterly charmless. Okay, cool. There we go. Maybe I'm not the only one that thought this. So Variety is kind of agreeing with me. Variety is saying, Andrew Scott is utterly charmless in Netflix somber Ripley TV review. So let's see this. Um, Patricia Highsmith's 1955 crime novel, The Talented Mr. Ripley, is regarded as one of the most greatest thrillers of all time. It has spawned several film adaptations, including Michael Mayhem's The Talented Mr. Ripley, starring Matt Damon and Jude Law, um, given the 99 films commercial and critical acclaim which is a really good movie by the way Jude Law was incredible in that movie I met him once in Dr. Martin's back in there when I used to work in the Dr. Martin store in Carnaby Street and he was absolutely lovely really lovely guy um, had I think he's kids with him I think he's got like three kids something like that something stupid at the time I was thinking right he's got quite a lot of kids and they were all really nice and well behaved which says a lot because you know famous people especially Hollywood people's kids are usually not the most well behaved kids in the world but he was really nice and the kids were really nice too so big up fucking Jude Law it says Ripley has Andrew Scott stepping into the titular um, character's loafers, the Academy Award winner script, um, director Stephen Zalian um, behind such works as Schindler's List and the 2016 HBO limited edition series The Night Of presents his own spin on a psychological thriller. Shot in magnificent black and white. Again, that's the thing that people are rating, overrating it because it's just shot in black and white. It's almost akin to in a DJ world, if you, do a, if you play on vinyl, you're suddenly better than everybody else because you happen to play on vinyl. It's like, nah, mate, let's, let's, let's operate by the merit of your set and the music you're playing, not just by the format. You know what I mean? Just because you're playing, doesn't mean if you're playing on a MIDI player or, or a DJ controller or you're playing on a fucking vinyl, that you're better than other people. Like, let's judge the set for the set. Same goes for film, same goes for TV. It continues. Show Magnificent Black and White, Ripley opens in Rome in 1961 as a man drags a dead body down a marble staircase. But the story doesn't begin here. Dialing back in time six months ago, um, we find ourselves in New York's Lower East Side, a far cry from the trendy neighborhood scene in films of TV and shows today the area of the home to some of the big apple's most unsavory citizens here in the cramped rat infested apartment the audience is introduced to ripley a petty thief who's making um his living tricking patients of chiropractors out of their money just as his latest chance scheme is drying up he stumbles on an opportunity that will reshape his life forever at a bar one evening he's approached by a private investigator a criminally underused bockham woodbine who mistakes tom for a friend of his wealthy client's son shortly after tom is on a trip to to Italy, the um, task with enticing his friend Dickie Greenleaf, John Johnny Flynn, to return home to his concerned parents. Seeing his all expense paid trip to Europe and the Greenfield's wealth as a chance to grasp the lifestyle he believes he deserves, Tom sets off on a path on a dark path marred by lies, deceit, and murder. To be fair, one of the best bits I liked about Ripley, I'm not gonna lie, there's a scene in Ripley where the the play the the character Dickie Greenleaf one of his friends comes and visits him, um, Freddy something. And this friend is like a, a playwright. But then the character that's Ripley, Tom Ripley, um, he instantly recognizes the kind of chancery, waftery, bullshit nature of this guy. And that guy also noticed that, you know, Tom is a scammer. Like they kind of notice, they kind of, they kind of are mirror images of each other. They both kind of, you know, are faking the funk for lack of a better term. I thought that was a pretty good sort of depiction of, you know, one side of a person being this incredibly affluent kid who's the son of some rich person who's kind of trying to, you know, um, gallivant around the world acting as if they're a playwright. And then you've got somebody who obviously is in the down and dumps, hasn't really sorted their life out yet, is a petty criminal, but also sees themselves as more sophisticated and more chic. And you're coming against someone, you're kind of noticing, you know, you're kind of seeing somebody who kind of reminds you of yourself and a reminder that you're not ever going to be the version of you think of yourself, you think in your head, because you can always see through you. So you're conscious that if you can see through you, can other people see you too? Hmm. 
More aesthetically pleasing than narratively engaging, Ripley reveals missteps in the first few episodes. Um, since the characters are older in the previous adaptation, both Scott and Flynn are over 40, it's implausible that the Greenleys will send a man that they don't know in search of their adult son. Moreover, it, what is detached demeanor, Tom doesn't even fake the, the affini- aff- affection or familiarity needed to carry off this truce. That's a good point. While Dickie A, novice and untalented painter, received Tom warmly, um, his girlfriend Marge, Dakota Fanning, is immediately suspicious of abuse supposed acquaintance her instincts are correct by the end of chapter one a hard man to find tom begins formulating his plans to take sticky's lavish life for himself what's hard to reconcile is that tom is utterly charmless he is quirk his quick thinker who can meticulously plot his way out of dark corners but tom's sociopathic personality inability to show even a sliver of humanity make ripley an uncomfortable somewhat that's a very good point to be fair i think ripley in the film adaptation is a lot more charming has a lot more, um, has a lot more, you know, has a lot more likable traits about him. Whereas this version is a little bit, you know, he's a little bit dark, a little bit dry. He doesn't really come across as a warm person and it's hard to kind of root for him, even though you probably should be. Still, the show is stunning, cinematically display, um, boasting a lingering shots of the Ital- Italy's monuments, canals and architecture. But the episodes are painful, overlong and full of dead space. I agree. Since Tom spends a great deal of the time alone, plotting his next move or cleaning up his various bloody messes, viewers are forced to bide their time with him as he completes the laborious task typing false documents cleaning up evidence that could also be seen as a good thing to be fair the fact that they have these really long drawn out bits of like no dialogue with just background noises and shit and he's just rummaging around and walking around it kind of just shows you like you know the reality of that situation and you know how it is to be left alone with your thoughts while you are actively trying to scam somebody out of millions right do you know I mean it's kind of it kind of does put you there in the fucking film but it also sorry in the series but it could also kind of be a bit of a drag um last bit here additionally to, through tom is not though tom is a narcissist sorry with limited people skills dickie and marge aren't much better whether or not the viewer roots for tom lies and schemes and the show's central couple are very much are very little depth dickie is aloof naive and a trust fund baby who had the world handed to him while he certainly doesn't deserve to be one of tom's victims his lack of astuteness makes him easy pitiful prey meanwhile despite seeing through tom's facade facade sorry facade facade and marge allows her discernment to be bulldozed by a perceived rejection from dicky her ensuing character arc is a total letdown definitely agree with that one again um i saw some reviews really wanking over this so i'm glad to see variety are calling it as they see i don't think just before because you film something in black and white it should be deemed as good this should be deemed better than most i don't think because you just take 35 million 35 millimeter camera pictures that you're also a photographer it's just one of those things let's judge art by the merit of the art itself and for me ripley was incredibly boring um i, I didn't really enjoy watching it in the slightest and i was actually glad when it was over i'm not gonna lie so i'm sure most of you were aware i read this story on a podcast a couple episodes ago um, the title is andrew huberman's mechanism of control the private and public deductions of the world's biggest pop neuroscientist and essentially what this article from the new yorker via the publication called the intelligence written by a lady called kerry howley it kind of tried to propose this idea that huberman was a bad guy because he happened to be a bit of a player um from what i've led to believe he's actually not even married i thought he was married or something but he's not he's a completely single guy who unfortunately for the women involved was playing the field um according to his article he was have he had like six girlfriends on the go or maybe he had one serious girlfriend and six or five other affairs or five other kind of you know of stepping out of his relationship whatever it may be called or cheating on the women themselves but it wasn't anything that i would think would be deemed necessary to have this op-ed hit this hit piece kind of put out about him unless he was of course abusing um these women physically whatever it may be i don't think there's any need to really write these kind of articles unless it was again physical abuse harassment or something to be great but again we live in a weird world and cancer culture has gone from there was, I forgot who that comedian was. There was that Asian comedian who got taken down in the early parts of COVID because some girl didn't like the date. It was a very messy, from what I remember the article, I think it was on a website called Jezebel or something, right? It was a very, it was a very clunky, um, you know, 
whatever date it didn't really feel like the greatest time in the world but i don't think it was a necessary um platform to cancel the guy or to make him sound like he was a creep or an abuser or something it was just like a horrible date and those things happen all the time you just have to suck it up and kind of move on and in this case i think the framing of this article they're trying to purposely make andrew huberman out to be like andrew tate or something it's kind of giving that sort of vibe right he's a handsome dude charming guy um he has like a bunch of women on the go at the same time kind of giving tate vibes um he has this kind of lifestyle this sort of biohacking thing that he's trying to promote maybe similar with the andrew tate's idea a bit about getting out of the matrix like it kind of felt that there were little bits of like four similarities between him and andrew tate even though i don't think that was the problem the case i think they tried to do that so i think that was too heavy-handed i think if you want to paint the guy out to be maybe not the most honest guy maybe not the most um what's that word called maybe not the most congruent because i think that's something that i've also struggled with online like how do you be how do you how do you be congruent when you don't really want to reveal much of yourself anyway like because i feel like for myself when i'm making content and shit it's not really about me it kind of is, but it isn't. It's all about the stuff that I talk about that I find interesting. Other people also find it interesting, but you're just using me as a conduit. I'm sort of like the vessel that brings it, but I'm not really the most important thing. I'm just talking about the thing that you've kind of maybe thought about and I'm saying I'm vocalizing it or maybe the things that I think about you disagree with, but at least you have somebody to kind of go back and forth with it in your head or with your friend group. That's basically it. So it's not really about me. It's about the content. So it's not really the need for me to insert myself in the content. But I'm also somebody that doesn't like to, you know, I'm not into the playing games thing. I can't really be the most, I'm not really good at being deceitful or being able to keep up a facade and shit. So I find it hard to like, you know, have like one face that's for this and one face that's for that. It, it, it's all just the one thing for me. Personally, it's just the one, with the one thing. So if that's the one thing, how do you do that online? You know, while maintaining some level of like privacy or whatever it may be. And it's hard to do that. It really is. And I think in Andrew Huberman's case, being a handsome, good looking, in shape guy that he is, super intelligent, um, you know, you'd imagine pretty successful and made a bunch of money. You're going to be quite desirable to a lot of people out there. And if you're not married and shit and you want to play the field, I don't know, do your shit in it, N knock them down. Um, yeah, Huberman lays down pipe. He's doing the damn thing. Everybody loves it. Well, the ladies do at least, or some do. Well, Here's a development. Joe Rogan earlier today sat down with Andrew Schultz on his podcast or on Andrew Schultz came on Joe Rogan's podcast and he dropped a bit of a massive bomb revelation regarding this whole Andrew Huberman thing because Joe Rogan's close friends with Andrew Huberman. He hasn't really publicly commented on it or anything, but he has a very interesting bit of information here that may kind of shine a light a little bit on what actually happened behind the scenes. So hear this clip and let me know what you think about this conspiracy theory of sorts. What do you think about this conspiracy theory? Do you believe it? Do you buy it? Do you don't buy it? I'm, I'm curious to know what you think regarding Andrew Huberman fucking a bunch of chicks and having them all on the go at one time and that article being a bit of a nonsense hit piece. Hear about what Rogan has to think about it here regarding this information he got directly from Huberman himself. So we're talk talking about Andrew Huberman's situation. His situation, not Huberman. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that was left out of that article. People know, I assume everybody here knows exactly what happened. So there's an article that Andrew Huberman, an ex, got a hold of a reporter and said that he's a, f a philanderer, he's doing all these terrible things, he's a bad guy. Yeah. And so they write this long article. What they left out was that the person who accused him of all this... First of all, is being investigated by the DOJ for fraud and is in the middle of that right now. It's a very serious case. I would name the case, but that would – like they made the lady anonymous, which is also crazy. Like you could have an anonymous person who attacks this famous person yeah. with – which is essentially – whether it's true, what the things she's saying are true or not true – the stuff she left out, the DOJ oh, stuff. Oh, that's when he breaks it off. Exactly. He breaks it off. The she DOJ feels contacts him because they're investigating this woman. And you think that that would be like maybe the first paragraph of You would the think article. that would at least be a part of the article. Yeah. If it was a real piece of news. Yeah. You would say, oh, this is complicated. Yeah. Hmm. They're now alleging that Huberman somehow is under attack from the deep state, which is fucking hilarious. But I wonder if there's some truth in it. If you think about Huberman being this vessel of like information, especially biohacking wise, he's sort of like the evolution of like, you know, Tim Ferriss and some shit to the masses. I think Tim Ferriss was masses, but probably still a bit niche. Huberman's probably out, out, you know, outpaced him over, you know, um, um, what you call it? 
in terms of success and reach and whatever maybe and he does kind of have these protocols which are very accessible very easy to kind of do for most people buying particular vitamins or whatever maybe from fucking amazon and shit so clearly in that respect maybe um the pharmaceutical industry in in, um, in america kind of looks at him as a bit of a threat because he's allowing people information to things that they probably wouldn't have access to because he's a legit scientist on this malarkey and he can maybe have people wean themselves off of the dependencies of like you know of these drugs that these pharmaceutical companies are shelling out there in america so maybe there is some there is something to it but a part of me the cynical side of this is saying to me why would they think huberman is that big of a deal that they would you know have would they would kind of purposely put him in some sort of honey trap situation because it's not that big of, it's sort of like it's sort of like an idea of like you trying to what's that word called you trying to like make yourself a bigger person than what you are via this contract. I wonder, there's probably a word for it where you try to purposely like make yourself look like you're a bigger victim than what you are. In a way, it makes you a bigger part of the story. In a way, it makes you look like a bigger deal. So it's kind of like a weird thing. It's sort of like, hey, I'm admitting that maybe this is why I, this is why they're trying to cancel me, but it also makes me look like a big wig. But then on the other side, it doesn't really explain. If you look at the article, as this, if this is a rebuttal for the article. Then what about the other five girls that he allegedly sold dreams to? What was that all about? Was that a rebound? Did he need to rebound five times and tell lies and create a whole different fable and story and narrative and whatever five different times? Is that is that believable? I don't think so. But let's continue. Hey, so what do you think it is? Do you think it could come from pharmaceutical companies? I don't think there's zero influence you know, I mean, I think for sure. Look, with the stuff that happened to me. That's what I was going to ask. What, what do you think it comes from? That was 100% influenced by pharmaceutical drug companies. Political interest too? Yeah. Well, those they're are all tied in together yeah. because they fund them. There is a responsibility and probably the governments around the world will never do it. Um, but they do need to apologize for the amount of fear mongering that happened during COVID. I still think COVID was a legit thing. I think people obviously legitimately died many more than probably needed to. I think it did affect people very, very negatively. But for some reason, other people didn't affect them at all. And that was something that a lot of um, governments a lot of fucking health officials were refusing to acknowledge because they were so scared if they did acknowledge it because I guess they were aware that human brains, human nowadays have short attention spans, we are easily influenced and led and we don't need much encouraged to do something. I guess maybe in their logical brains, they thought if we acknowledge the fact that some people get COVID and are perfectly fine, it's going to make people think they don't need to get a vaccine. So they just kept ramping up the fear. Hey, have you heard about this person? This, this number of people died in this place. Look at all these open more look at these further they're running out places to bury the fucking bodies they're burning them in fucking piles in fucking India people are getting locked in their houses in fucking China to just do the thing they sort of get ramping up the hysteria to make us all scared so that we could take the va get the vaccine and obviously they, they, they made it incentive based hey if you want to travel the world if you want to go back eating in restaurants if you want to go back to pubs you have to fucking have the vaccine so I think they purposely kind of fed into the hysteria to do that but I don't like this retconning of COVID Joe's trying to act like it didn't exist, like it wasn't that big of a deal. It was. It wasn't the flu. It was a very serious, more lethal version of the flu. But let's not try and act like it was just the flu. It wasn't because people were dying by the hundreds and thousands. Now, some of them maybe misdiagnosed, whatever, called. Cool. There was that period of time where people were fucking, anytime somebody died, they were fucking writing it down as COVID. I understand. But let's be fair. We all know people who actually legitimately died. There's actually a documentary out at the moment. There's this one particular newsreader in the moment. I forgot her name. Actually, let me see it. I think her name, there's this woman. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Guardian TV Review. Guardian, let's see. Guardian TV, it's this woman, right? Who's got, whose husband unfortunately passed away because of COVID. And he died like horribly, like he died like he had like fucking cancer or some shit. He started to like wither away, lost some motor functions and shit. Like it was an awful fucking way to go out. This is the woman, yeah. This woman called Kat Garraway, right? Um, Kat Garraway, Derek Story reveal a rallying cry for the UK's number 10 to unsung heroes. Um, the final part of a trilogy documentary is about the TV presenter's husband and battle with COVID are honest, right? And so her husband called Derek Garraway, I'm assuming. 
unfortunately died of fucking COVID and it was a long drawn out process where he was in, you know, hospital in and out and shit. Like here's here's going, right? There's we go. Let me let me just show you on Wikipedia and read a bit here for you how he actually passed away. Um where is it? Blah 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 blah. Let's go down. Personal life. Where is it? Have we got anything about the COVID thing? Is it there? Where is it? Korea, radio, charity. Yeah, there you go. Um, da, 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 da. In September 2005, Caraway married um, Derek Draper. Derek Draper, sorry, in Camden. Draper was a political aide for Labour Cabinet Minister Peter Mandelson, right? So this is him, right? Derek Draper. Boom, boom. Um, Draper was hospitalized with COVID in the March 2020 and he was admitted in intensive care unit he was still in critical condition in an induced coma for after two months so this guy got covid right covid that people usually recover from and he was in a coma for two fucking months following a month he had opened his eyes but remained hospital in a serious condition he was still super he's still hospital after a year later so this is the most long drawn out COVID death I've seen in a while. This is like beyond long COVID. Draper returned home on a trial basis on April 2021. Following the following month, Garraway gave an update saying that he was still devastated by COVID and immobile. In September 21, she reported that he was still receiving round the clock care and sleeping 20 hours a day. That month, she won a National Television Award for her ITV documentary, Finding Derek, which chronicled her experience with long COVID and the effects of her on her family. He received treatment in Mexico in February and March 2022. Garraway revealed in March, April, in April 2022 that Draper was struggling to speak and that he can understand sometimes, do odd words, but can't express himself. Draper required round-the-clock care. In December 2023, he suffered a cardiac arrest admitted to hospital again and was called a very serious condition draper died on the night of 3rd of january 2024 so this guy like went through it coma cardiac arrest like eventually ended up dying like was it three three or four years later after getting the fucking virus so clearly that shit was real so sometimes when these guys talk about covid i feel like they retcon it um i'm not sure if it's on purpose but it's almost like an insult to our intelligence because it obviously was serious it's just that for them it obviously affected them business-wise, career-wise, and they haven't forgiven the CDC or the governments for it, right? For stopping them doing copes, for them insulting them doing stand-up comedy, which is understandable. It's their passion, whatever it may be. But this retconning of COVID is fucking annoying. Yeah. So you've got pharmaceutical drug interests that, A, fund the network, yeah. right? They pay for so much of the advertisement, So right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you now can't just cut that to the advertisers. Yes, yeah, yes, you yes. cut. If, if the news said no more pharmaceutical drugs, like let's imagine if the government says this. Yeah. The government says no more pharmaceutical drug contributions to super PACs, no more pharmaceutical drugs ads on te television shows and newspapers. Jeez. I think nowadays, especially with how crazy the world is, I think there is no such thing as a conspiracy theory. You just have to find your evidence to kind of back up your claim so i'm open to everything i just think personally there needs to be acknowledgement on both sides governments cdc type of institutions and shit need to come out and say hey we hold our hands up because we purposely misused the threat of covid to get people to comply to get this vaccine because we we're afraid the numbers will go crazy high we weren't really prepared for this happening bloody blah, blah 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 we kind of use this to our benefit right just kind of i wouldn't they would never say that of course but that was kind of what it felt like. They kind of purposely misused COVID and the kind of hysteria around it to kind of force people to get vaccines because they weren't sure what else to do, right? You know, have no option on the table, get the vaccine. And obviously it ended up with other side effects, you know, the myocarditis, all this sort of shit. People are getting long effects of COVID and whatever it may be in the future. But I feel like the people on the other side need to also be honest and say it wasn't just a flu because we've all gotten flus. We haven't heard of, I, I can't name a single time a friend of mine or somebody I've known has gotten the flu and has been hospitalized or has been ill or has been dead, like f f fatally. I can't name it. But with COVID, I can name a ton of people, friends of friends who I've known who unfortunately got COVID and they passed away. Some of them got COVID, didn't even notice and they were completely fine. My little brother's been a good example of it. I don't think even my little brother's got, got the jab. And they're the most messy disgusting unhygienic brats i've seen in my life one of them got it and just was really ill and just kind of stayed at home and that and that was basically it and i don't think he even stayed at home seriously throughout the whole thing but sometimes it affects people badly something it doesn't affect our people at all but there needs to be an acknowledgement on both sides that it was legit it was a legit threat and the, probably the, the the our inability as you know as a civilization to deal with it in a mature way or in a kind of balanced nuanced way or in a grown-up way, in a responsible way, says a lot about how useless we'd be if another threat came about that was way more lethal 
than a COVID, whether it's nuclear, whether it's whatever, war, whatever, something else happened to kind of threaten our fucking, you know, existence, I think we would be useless to kind of defending ourselves against it because we're all kind of looking out for ourselves. There is no like collective um, responsibility. It doesn't really exist. The moment everyone kind of figured out or was like, oh, these marks are bullshit, everyone sort of dumped them when really the masks were never about you. They were, they were about the collective, about, about everybody else, if anything. It was like a representation of like, I wouldn't say, com it was a representation of like, not compliance, of like cooperation. But we weren't willing to do it because by that time we all kind of felt like we'd been lied to. We have felt enough. We felt restricted. Like it was like a mask on our face, like a fucking prison. I don't know. Either way, it was fucking lame. And I hate the retconning. Let's continue with this clip. No more. Then you have to fill a massive void mm -hmm. that's missing from those ads. And you're going to have to bring in Toyota trucks and fucking all these different things. Yeah. But you're missing out on a lot of fucking money. So if that's a giant portion of your ad revenue, yeah. you're going to avoid all conversations about vaccine injuries. Yes. They're not yes. going to come up. You are going to shut them down and go to commercial. Yes. You're going to say, well, the studies don't show that. The study, don't, you'll talk over RFK. Yeah. What you're saying is just simply not true. Vaccines are the reason why we don't have blah, 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 blah. Yes. The, the vaccines have never been shown to show to cause autism. Vaccines, and we'll, we'll be right back. Right. Like when people bring up the evidence that maybe that horse tranquilizer medication that he took, right, which was a, an alternative um, way to kind of combat COVID that it might have some side effects or it might not help others the way it helped him, he's not willing to entertain that either. So I think everybody's kind of like dogmatic, tribal in their own way, which is really unfortunate, really, because it really doesn't matter in that respect. But in general, I feel like this defense of Huberman is interesting because it really doesn't really... It kind of doesn't. It does, it kind of is a bit. It's kind of as useless as this article. I'm not gonna lie. Maybe for some fans of Huberman, you might be disappointed because you felt like he was a Christian man. He was a chill man. He was a honest man. Whatever. Right? It might kind of ruin your image of him that way. But what he gets up to in his private life, especially when he's not married, is really not my concern. Even if he was married, I really couldn't give a fuck because his utility is the fact that he's able to bring this type of information when it comes to self actualization biohacking, whatever it may be, um, human optimization. He's been able to bring it to the masses in a very digestible way. Because if you think about it, I don't know if you guys remember Huberman when he first kind of do, was doing the podcast rounds, he was very hard to kind of warm to or understand because he was very analytical, very educated, very kind of intellectual, very kind of school teachery type of vibes he wasn't very warm wasn't very charismatic it took him a moment a time to kind of get used to being in front of camera and doing all that sort of shit so only over time we get to kind of know him to be kind of a nice chill guy but in general he was just there to provide you information do it as you please to kind of help yourself out whether it was from addiction whatever it may be you know health fitness all that sort of stuff he kind of did it lived the walk he kind of walked the walk and talked the talk but the private life shit doesn't matter. And I feel like this other information that we're getting from Rogan regarding Huberman maybe being under attack from the deep state because of all the stuff he's advocating for that might essentially put some of the big pharma companies out of business, it also doesn't do anything to really kind of tell you, you know, whether or not he's a good guy or not. It really doesn't. It does nothing. I'm not going to lie. They're both as useless as each other. Both articles don't do anything really to kind of dissuade any of the kind of the conversation. It's, it's all kind of a bit of a shame how it's all kind of played out. But in general, um, I still like Huberman. I feel like he played played it really well. He didn't really entertain any of it. Um, he just kind of steamrolled through the cancellation, which I think is a good way to go about it. I think, especially if you haven't been, if you haven't been accused of anything like grape or anything crazy like assault, the only really way to kind of combat cancel culture is to kind of act like it doesn't exist. I think Lizzo was the one that proved it, even though she's fucking annoying and she's whatever. But Lizzo proved if you just act like it never happened, it doesn't, it won't affect you, especially if it's not something super serious. If it's something super serious, you look like a fucking freak. But if you just keep steamrolling through and keep putting on your content, you'll be fine, especially nowadays. It's not like humans employed by CNN or by like ESPN or something, right? He's got his own podcast. He's got his own Patreon, probably. Maybe his own platform. Maybe his own books, whatever. That's what people kind of know him for. His fans don't care about that sort of shit. They just care about him being a useful person with the information that they feed out and they kind of go from there. So he's perfectly okay. And he kind of just read it and now he's kind of back to normal. So big up Huberman. Big up Andrew Huberman. Moving on from that one. I was randomly thinking about this. How far have we moved on as a society, right? How far has society come that we've got a situation 
where these sort of things happen in real time, right? Think about this. Let me let me get this up for you. Bear with me one second here, right? As I get this shit up for you, because I think this is absolutely phenomenal. So on one tab, on one blood claw bleeding tab, right? On one tab, you've got this. Ex-Tennessee cop Megan Hall fired of a sex tryst with six other officers settles the Fed lawsuit that will cost the city five hundred thousand dollars. So this lady, as most of you guys know, and um, she went viral a couple of years ago for essentially hooking up with the entire police force of where she was at in these weird kind of you know swinger sex open polygamy type of situations. Somehow this ended up being a grooming thing, and then she ended up being the victim in the situation, which is insane because she seemed like a complying adult um, or complying consenting adult who was cheating on her husband with you know maybe more than 10 guys in one fucking place absolutely crazy and then she ends up kind of winning a lawsuit because i'm a, i'm guessing if you look into it especially with it being a workplace there is a lot of kind of um what's that word called there is a lot of um, lines being crossed and there is that idea i forgot what the term of it is called i think it's like a power thing really which is not really the best which is why they usually in most workplaces they do kind of have the relations between co-workers to be explicitly out of order and you're not going to do if you do do it you can get fucking fired so the fact that she was able to get something out of this is probably says more about how hr is and how fucking companies work more so about her being in any kind of right that's one thing. And then on the other tab, you've got this article, courtesy of the Times, slut shame at 22, an icon at 50, how Monica Lewinsky got her life back. Once a victim of political scandal, the activist and writer is now the face of major fashion campaign, Helen Rubilo report. So this is Monica Lewinsky looking absolutely dashing at 50 years old, right? Somebody who I feel like got an unfair treatment for her affair with Bill Clinton back in the day. And if you think about it, really, she did nothing wrong, not in any way, shape or form comparable to this Megan Hall woman. This woman, Monica Lewinsky, had a affair with a man who's well known to be a bit of a player himself. A man that did essentially, you know, sully the fucking, you know, um, the Oval Office with his own sexual exploitation and his own lust and should be held more of accountable for his actions than what she should have held, be held accountable. Or if anything, they should have been held to a similar level of scrutiny, but it didn't obviously happen in that way. And now kind of Bill Clinton's been lauded this old wide sage type of guy but i feel like they both should have been ridiculed if that be the case but she's i feel like monica Lewinsky is just super unlucky that's it she's just super unlucky that her, the situation that she went through happened when it happened because i feel like if it happened nowadays there's no way she would have been slut shamed or would have been a social pariah or been an outcast or would have been trying to reinvent herself a million million times to try and get fucking her career or her life back in order i don't think that would have ever happened she would have been heralded she would have been put on the fucking pulpit she would have been her, you know she would have been interviewed from every fucking podcast under the sun she would have had a you know many different you know um what you call it deals under a book she would have been fucking rolling in money and she would have been looked at differently in the history books but nowadays because things have changed we've now got this i feel like objectively horrendous person in megan hall don't get me wrong this woman is just as is bad but the police officers that engaged in this sexual fucking um gangbang thing are just as bad but the fact that this woman was able to get some money out of the situation despite being a consenting adult in this whole sex capade shit is crazy like you're not the victim the real victim here is your husband who you cheated on more than six times the real victim here is the people of that small state where she's from who had a police force that were not even you know on job they were, they were more preoccupied with banging some woman that is essentially a one out of two or one out of ten if not a zero right that they should be out there arresting people within their local town, solving crimes and shit. And they were busy banging this absolute troglodyte, absolutely insane. And then uh, when it all comes to a head, when it all kind of gets put out there in the open, instead of owning up to it and being a big boy and kind of putting your big girl pants on and kind of, you know, owning it and kind of walking away from it with your head held up high, she then tries to paint herself as a victim and unfortunately so ends up being agreed and she gets some money for it. Absolutely shocking, shocking affair. Because if she's owed 500k for this, how much should fucking Monica Lewinsky get? If she can get 500k, how much should Monica Lewinsky get, really? That's the situation you have to ask yourself. If she can get 500k, how much should Monica Lewinsky get? Think. How much should she get? It's absolutely horrendous, man. Absolutely horrendous. I'll read the article a bit for you here. 
It says four Tennessee cops who got axed for their luck for their tryst um, with six six officers on the job have settled their federal civil lawsuit against her former employer for a whopping five hundred thousand dollars. Megan Hall, who claims she was sexually groomed, what does that even mean? Sexually groomed? What does that even mean? It's just words, isn't it? Sexually groomed? What does that mean? Like, come on, bro. By a, by a cadre of male colleagues on the force sued the city of Valverne um, last year after the word of the raunchy romps, romp, so it made national headlines. That should be it, it should, that should, that's actually in the, in the public's best interest to know. You can't keep that stuff hidden. The public should know what the what their fucking funds, what their taxpayer dollars is being spent on. And if it's being spent on a fucking inept, kind of ineffective police force that's more worried about banging fucking ones in the fucking staff room, then it should be fucking put in national news. I'm sorry. On Wednesday, Laverne board voted three to one at a special meeting of settled the suit. Big up the person that, that voted against, by the way. You're a fucking legend. That one person who stood in the opposition, you're a legend. The Laverne board of mayor and aldermen voted tonight to authorize the mayor to sign a settlement agreement with the city of Laverne and a former police officer, Megan Hall. Um, the agreement was negotiated between the attorneys representing the city hall. The insurance provider will pay a sum of five hundred thousand as a gross settlement, which includes court costs, attorney fees, and expenses. Oof. To be fair, though, to be fair, to be fair in the situation, five hundred k isn't a lot, is it? I don't know what a police salary is per year at her level. Thirty, fifty k. Um, once she pays her lawyer, what's that money gonna go? To? What's that money gonna go down to? She's out of a job now. Probably not going to be a police officer anymore. Right? I'm assuming if something like this happens to you, you don't go back in the force again, do you? You're probably blacklisted. You probably looked at as a bit of a snitch. So she's probably not going to be welcomed back into the police force anytime soon. So now you have to live a life as a private citizen, I guess. What She has to do what? Change her name? Move location? 500k won't go a long way. In this economy, 500k isn't a lot of money. So even though she got some money out of it, she still got fucked, you know? Ironically so. Even though she got some money out of it, she still got fucked. The agreement was negotiated. The, the city denies any admission of liability. She's 28 years old. Jesus Christ. Made national headlines after her station house escapade went public. According to internal investigation, Hall hooked up with several colleagues, then sent them nude pictures and went topless in a Girls Gone Wild theme hot tub party and even performed oral sex on two cops. Bro, was she the, was, was she the only cop there that was female? fucking hell bro or she just I, i'm wondering if she maybe did, did have some um inklings for like group play and stuff and she was into like public gangbangs and stuff because how could somebody be like working but then also be this level of horny to fuck everybody like this it's so odd i've heard of some workplaces where maybe boys and girls hook up with each other and are in relationships but i've never heard of like a girl being like actively wanting to fuck every single guy in that office it's so weird it's usually something that you see guys do Especially like in very cis heteronormative ex places, you'll see a lot of guys like, you know, try and do this type of stuff, but you don't really see a lot of women. So I wonder if this was kind of a weird sex play thing. Like what's that thing called? Um what's that what's that sub called? There's a subreddit for it. Or places or like a genre in porn. What's it called? Is it like it's not is, is it is it cuck is it cuckold? I don't think it's cuck what is that porn? What is it called? It's called like it is cuckold, isn't it? Where you like watching your wife do stuff. But it's not like that. It's the, the one I'm thinking about is the one where they send they'll send their husband pictures and videos of what they're doing. And the husband will be like, hey, what are you up to? Oh yeah, I'm just getting railed by fucking Sergio in the fucking, in the back of the van. I forgot what that genre is called. There's a genre of porn that's like that where they send each other pictures and videos like, oh my God, accidentally sent my picture, accidentally sent me to send this to the girls, but send this to my husband. There's a genre of it. I forgot what it's called. It's not cuckolding, it's something else. It's not voy. I don't know. Whatever it's called, I think she's into it. But honestly, like, she must be the only woman there because pff, she's not that cute at all. Zero. But it does go to show with guys. That's why, that's why I think women should probably know this more so than anybody. Women should have this in the back of their mind. When guys cheat, it's rarely, rarely about looks. It's just about, ac it's just about access. If the access is there, you're going to take the chance to do it. Most guys will do that. If they have access to somebody that's got no morals, no principles, that has no standards and just has a fucking gaping hole for you to kind of plow, they will plow because it requires no effort. It requires no investment. It requires nothing. It just requires you being having a heartbeat or in some cases having a particular skin tone then they're going to fucking go it. So it's not really about them trying to, oh, they don't love you. They don't want their family. No, it's just the option. The access is there. 
The actress is there. She's got a smile. She's got thin teeth. She's got thin lips and shit, right? Kind of do your job, but it's not really a it's not really a representation of how they. F That's a really fucked up shit about it. Probably the double standards thing. When guys cheat, it's rarely about what they think about the person they're with, and it's mostly about them selfishly. In or it obviously is about them, but in that moment, it's just about what they want in that moment. Like, can I get this easily? Is it available? Yes, cool. Because most guys can't walk away, which is why a lot of us, you know, I think we can look at the whole P Diddy thing and we see guys saying, oh yeah, I went to the Diddy party but I knew when to leave. We know that's bullshit because we know most guys, what we're like, when stuff gets down and the lights start to turn red and panties start flying, that's when we kind of settle down in our chairs. Most of us don't go, oh, that's my time to leave. I'm going to go get my lunchbox. I'm going to go get my shoes and I'm going to go home to my family. You know, most guys are not like that. Most guys are like, hey, once it starts to get a bit seedy, once things start to get a little bit risque, <laughs> once the handcuffs come out, some of us fucking, you know, unbuckle our fucking pants, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, some of us sleaze bags out there. It continues. Um, what you call it? What is it? What is it? Oh, this is a funny one. Um, the shocking investigative report included findings that the then police chief, Bur Burrell Chip Davis, who was fired over the scandal, not only knew Hall's hookups, but joked about the situation with other colleagues. Who that? Davis allegedly said when shown a vulgar photo of Hall by another cop, Ty McGowan, the investigation found. Hall, Lewis said. He on it again, said Chief Crypt. The ex-top cop also joked about a 13-minute video that allegedly showed Hall masturbating. She was wanking on video for 13 minutes. Yo, this woman didn't deserve to be a police officer, man. 13 minutes. Go do your fucking job, man. Put your phone down. Put down the fucking... Take your fingers out, your fucking snatch, and go and arrest some people. What are you fucking doing? Which was shared among the cops inside the apartment. 13-minute video. Yo, this woman was fucking horny. Um, another person that... Oh, look, this guy looks... Look, this guy kind of looks like Dana White, isn't it? This guy kind of looks like Dana White. And the shocking thing is, the husband stayed with her. And look at this guy. The husband stayed with her. You know, the husband fucking stayed with her. So, you know, as much as I like to say... As much as we all know... As much as we know... As much as society hasn't really changed, I feel like we have gone... We have evolved somewhat because I feel like in days gone by... If this, if this happened when Monica Lewinsky was around, this woman would have been vilified, maybe even more so than she is now. So she's kind of fortunate in a way that it happened at, at this time it's happened. The only sad thing I think about this for her is that her life is basically ruined, right? What job can she do now going forward? What job can she actually do? Do you know? So maybe that 500,000 was like a was like a graceful thing that they, they could do given the situation at hand in terms of trying to allow her to get back onto her feet in some way because as a woman her life is fucked the guys could probably get back on their feet somewhere or the other they're not going to be as publicly humiliated or scorned as she will but you can imagine if she lives in a small town she's still there she's going to be looked at a certain way she won't be able to have certain friends like everything's kind of fucked for her so maybe the forty thousand, maybe the sorry the five hundred thousand was more of a um, of a gesture of goodwill as opposed to an admittance that the police force did anything wrong because she did something wrong herself and i i, I think that somehow when i see that sentiment it almost feels like it kind of absorbs her blame but maybe it doesn't maybe it's just an acknowledgement that hey you know your life is kind of fucked here's us trying to give you a way out so you don't blow your brains out and then blame it on us in your suicide note that's what i'd imagine but hey what do i know what do i bloody know absolutely yes you guessed it nothing moving on let's talk about this so um i went to this because i thought this is kind of important to talk about um, because it needs to be said so um big up my um instagram friend called natalie Petit, who i've kind of known you know from afar because of you know being out and about and being a bit, a bit of a loser that goes out to fucking clubs all the time i was lucky enough to meet her and her boyfriend um i'm gonna say is his name martin is it martin i forgot his name god forgive me um if you are out there i do apologize for not remembering your name but i did meet her and her boyfriend one time when i was out and then i obviously went to a party that she put on on fold a few years ago and they are very plugged into the berlin techno scene they do parties they host things she works in the industry as well behind the scenes and shit they're kind of you know the go-to people when it comes to techno and whatever it means out there so the other day she posted this thing on her instagram um regarding a very um 
traumatic event that happened to her while she's working from what i can describe from what i can assert from what i can kind of read between the lines working at a club called um, watergate she didn't name it in the statement but she basically detailed um this experience that she had that wasn't the greatest and she kind of has now decided to set up a charity an ngo um that is basically going to be helping flinter which i think stands for female lesbian intersex trans um, I don't know what the A is for, people in nightlife in order to help them get on their feet or to support them in situations where they feel like they've been abused, harassed, wherever it may be in the nightlife industry, which is going to be pretty vital considering what she kind of detailed. So there's a clip about it where she kind of, you know, rounds, kind of gives a summary of what she's saying. And then there's also a statement that she prepared here at the back of these videos that kind of details exactly what happened. And I'm going to read it to you as well. But let's just quickly go through the video because I want to show you what she actually said in the video itself because this might give us an idea of where she's kind of going and then I'm going to obviously talk about a little bit about it as well because I think it's an important thing to discuss concerning everything that's going on right now in the techno scene. Hey guys, so um, I wanted to take this opportunity to be a little bit more vulnerable and open on social media and talk about a topic that's very, very important to me and also about an incident that just occurred to me that I really needed to talk about. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Natalie and um, I've been working as a booker and event consultant, event producer and so on um, for four years in this industry. And well, I lived through a bunch of horrible incidents with my male colleagues and I never spoke out. I've been told that my career will be ruined and that I will never find a job again if I speak out or that I must have slept with someone to get where I am. And I never thought I could get brave enough and find the courage to speak out about what happened because I was too afraid myself and I was too afraid of the consequences and that my career might be over after I really say something. I gave these men the power over me and over what I can say. Also, a bunch of my other female and flinter friends and queer friends have, have been a subject to similar experiences and very, very bad, bad incidences with men. And they were also too afraid to speak out. So at the moment, we're all too afraid to say anything. And these men become more and more powerful. Well, we make us smaller and smaller until we're not there anymore. And after what happened to me a few weeks ago, I decided that enough is enough and I won't give these men the power anymore. I really want to change something. So me and my friend Nini, we were working on a concept of an NGO to support women and Flinta people in need in the electronic music scene. If it's financial support, if it's psychological support, financial advisory, many things more. Well, I just wanted to say this was in the making and working on it. So the issue itself regarding what happened to her, because she wasn't really forthcoming in the video itself. She did look kind of, you know, scared, I guess. Somebody that kind of looked like she maybe had been crying um, maybe before making a video. So clearly something she wasn't comfortable saying aloud on video. But she did um, do us a favour by typing it all up and give us an idea of what is occurring behind the scenes. And again, from what I've been reading in the comments, it seems like this, this happened during her time working at Watergate. Watergate is one of the most, I guess one of the other premier Berlin venues um, out there, except for fucking, um, what's it called? Except for, except for Berghain. It's very iconic because of its, its design and because of the location. But unfortunately in recent years, Watergate has now suddenly turned into like the fabric of Berlin. 
They have really shitty nights there, very commercial. It's a kind of a bit more of a laddie crowd around there. And in general, it's kind of fallen by the wayside, which is really unfortunate because the location is fucking beautiful, right? Right next to the river, um, overlooking the river, basically. Nice, amazing lounge type of area. The dance floor is fucking sensational. Look at this LED light system they've got, right? This row, this massive row of lights that go from one end to the other end. It's fucking stupendous. I think they've copied this design in other clubs as well. So it's a really iconic, um, impressive um, venue that is kind of a, a part of the mainstay, part of the, part of the fabric over there in the techno scene in Berlin, especially historically from the people that have played there and have kind of come from the legendary parties that used to be there back in the day i can think of one in particular called i think it's like cookies and something like cookies and cream back in the day that i've kind of went to so it's a shame to see that it's kind of fallen by the wayside but it's definitely not the same place it was anymore it's now kind of like a fabric essentially type of vibes so she kind of detailed what exactly happened so let's actually see here courtesy of instagram account what occurred while she was working at watergate allegedly um so this is the following I started working at a very well-known Berlin club, continuing my career as a booker. Before I was hired at the club, I made great pro sorry, um, the club made great promises of changing and moving in a new diverse, um, inclusive and modern direction. In the past, the club had been known for bringing quite mainstream, having a mostly male slash touristy audience. Oopsie, that's me, right? I fall into two of those categories. That's a problem with techno scene, even though I'm technically a minority, even though I'm technically a, um, what's that thing called? Even though I'm technically, um, what's that what they're called a poc right even though technically a poc because i've got a dick i'm always going to be classed as in the male text so i'm always like a toxic male heteronormative cisgendered male and i'm also a tourist because i don't live there so duh, two bits i can't fucking shake right anyway continue um not having the best reputation but i was happy to be involved and propose changes and given my background of what i could bring to the table it seemed like a perfect fit cool so far so good i wasn't the only booker at the club there was another male booker in fact his person was who recommended me to be the bosses to the bosses he knew exactly what i stand for which party i'm known for working with and i came into the club under the given promises we'd be working as a team so again you can already see promises made probably promises not fulfilled the first few weeks everything was fine we were making some improvements we were working well together i outlined some plans and everyone seemed enthusiastic about the future changes i convinced um some of the queer parties that i've worked with closely over the years to also come to the club they were very well established queer parties that had been around for many years i presented them to these new opportunities at the time of change and how we could embark on this journey together and make a new safer space for the community now she's saying this i gather because i'm assuming some of these queer parties are very strict and very kind of um are very hesitant and resistant or very kind of skeptical about working with certain clubs because the potential to fuck up their whole thing is very high because if they decide to kind of get a bit i won't say money hungry but if they decide to kind of maybe go for the bigger venue that sometimes the bigger venue that doesn't really understand their culture doesn't understand their scene doesn't understand what they stand for could eventually kind of fuck up the entire vibe and sometimes all it takes is one bad party a very enthusiastic you know gregarious um engaged comment section and suddenly your party's gone so they have to be very protective of how they kind of put their party so if they decide to put it in your place they're trusting you they're trusting you to give them control to maybe understand where they're coming from to have a, a you know to maybe install a specific team to kind of handle some people and get whatever it may be but that's probably a big deal so you know you can imagine you know she probably took a big risk you know even recommending those clubs that club to the people there because it could eventually maybe even sully her name it continues i was beginning to feel at home but then the first weird situation occurred i was alone in the office with the owner of the club who's also the boss that's always a always a always a hard thing to fucking wrangle in it the male booker and another male colleague so she's in the office with three guys uh, by herself which is you know is what it is i guess it's the industry unfortunately i think on the face of it they like to make it seem like it's inclusive and diversive and, div and diverse but behind the scenes i'm assuming like supreme like how tremaine was complaining about supreme I'm guessing most of the electronic music scene is quite cisgendered white male type of thing. That's probably it because they're probably the people who were around when, you know, in the infancy of the scene and they're still around now, which is the only thing that I don't like about the scene. I think these guys need to kind of make some space for new people, but, you know, we'll speak about it another time. Um, I was in the office with the owner, um, the was also the boss, the male booker and another male colleague. The owner of the club started to joke about how the other male booker has had sex with every girl who's ever worked in the club right while I'm sitting there. Obviously, this made me feel very uncomfortable and quite disgusted. I was suddenly very conscious of the fact that I was the only full-time female 
an employer in the office full of mostly straight men. I started to question the intentions of why I was hired. I had no intention of having sex with anyone at the club. I tried to forget about the situation. It was the start of me feeling not so good. I'm aware now that this is sexual harassment and explains why it did not make me feel good. Now, when I initially read this, I was thinking to myself, how is that sexual harassment? If somebody says something, again, no matter how, it, it, it could be vulgar, but they say something not to you, but just in your presence, especially at work, how could that be sexual harassment? But then I thought to myself, hold on. If my partner came back home and told me this story, I would go back to the office with a baseball bat. Do you know what I mean? I, without, even, without even a hint of hesitation. I would directly pull up to the office and just smack somebody over the head. Obviously, it might lead to a termination, but that would make me feel good. So I can understand if that would make me that angry, that if a woman is in that situation, working, you know, doing your thing on your laptop, trying to call, do, organize your fucking thing, and you've got these guys around you trying to, like, you know, do dick measuring contests by talking aloud about how many girls are they fucked, like it's going to impress you. I can imagine how it can make you feel. Um, especially when you're the new girl there and you're maybe look a certain way or you're friendly with them. You can maybe almost almost think, oh shit, were they being friendly with me because they thought I was going to fuck? What, did, did they think I was being too friendly because I went to fuck? Did they take, did they think because I wear the certain clothes that I'm the, I can understand it can maybe feel weird. And I think in a work, personally for me anyway, if it was up to me, if it was up to me, I think all work environments should fucking outlaw and should make it very clear in the contracts that there is to be no hanky-panky between staff members. I think that could eliminate so much. If all that stuff is taken off the table and you just treat your colleagues like colleagues and you could just do the work without any kind of idea that you might want to fuck somebody, I think it makes for a far better working place. I think the fact that that stuff always lingers in the air it kind of makes situations harder to kind of deal with especially in the nightlife scene where people are already intoxicated on drugs or this malarkey it kind of just makes it unnecessarily messy so i wish there was a scenario where you could completely outlaw it but i guess you can't really control what adults do when adults are doing what adults do and you can't really be around them to police them all the time but this is pretty awful i can imagine to be in that situation. Definitely, 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 definitely fucking awful. It continues. Next page. Duh, duh, duh. Um, let's go. Let's go to the next page. Let's go. Let's go to the next page. Can you go to the next page? There we go. So, uh, we did that. Uh, yeah, there we go. So, during the first few weeks, I was focused on our plan to change the club. I'd reached out to a bunch of new artists and agents to pitch them the plan changes. This is when the other booker told me I shouldn't even bother, as he tried and failed many times before to get these same artists. However, I'm confident in my abilities and managed to book most of the people I contacted after I pitched to them my plans. Good, good little humble brag there. Big up Natalie. Bang, bang. When this happened, something changed, and from here on, the male booker started working against me. I was in his eyes that he made it feel very uncomfortable like it took something away from him of course it didn't seem like it i'm just doing my job and i saw us as a team moving one direction this is where the bullying started he basically stopped communicating with me he'd piss he'd get pissed at me he'd snap at me it got to the point where he wouldn't speak to me at all and just gave me the silent treatment we'd sit at the same desk in silence if i was bringing something up to discuss he he didn't like it he would just stop talking to me every time i got positive feedback or a compliment or a pat on the shoulder from another colleague or client, he'd have to insert a negative comment to put me down or make me f or make himself feel better. Some of other people and the staff members began to notice it and question why it was happening. Bearing in mind at this point, I'm still quote unquote the new girl, so I just let it go. So this is just more evidence that she was definitely hired under false pretense. Even the guy who she says was her friend who kind of recommended her for the job, it's clear to see that he kind of got her on board as a way to maybe try and fuck. It's what it seems like, which is kind of fucking wild that he had this fucking long drawn out plan to get this girl a job and then get comfortable with that. It's almost, it's almost like a weird, what's that? It's almost like a cult thing. He kind of tried to isolate her away from her group, take away from a quote unquote, her boy, take to, well, isolate her from her boyfriend, which is impossible because she fucking probably lives with a guy. But I'm guessing, um, take, isolate him, isolate her from a boyfriend, take her to another place, give her the job, to make her feel like she's indebted to him and then obviously when that conversation happened around her about hey we want to fuck or we know we fucked every girl in the office she obviously made it clear that she didn't want to do that and then i guess that made all the other guys think oh she's a waste of time and then obviously he got angry that she's obviously a waste of time she's not going to quote unquote fuck and that she's doing her job well and she's killing it they kind of turned the girl the cold shoulder and then this turned into workplace bullying because this feels more like this is like clearly a sign that that was probably sexual harassment because this is now turning into bullying 
This has now turned into bullying. This has now turned into fucking mental abuse. All this type of shit at the workplace where, you know, people are doing all these sort of like weird psychological games to you just because you didn't want to be the fucking, you know, the office slag. It's fucking horrendous to be fair. Let's continue. He then decided on his own to take over the whole calendar. He didn't leave me any real chance to have any influence or the other, um, any influence or other than what I'd already bought in. He stopped discussing events with me, booked more and more parties that apply um, only to the old drinking men crowd, knowing it was against everything we planned and agreed i love that term old drinking men crowd that's basically the challenge that all of these new um queer lgbtq focused raves are having to kind of battle against because most of the venues are owned by old drinking men crowds who service the old drinking men crowd but you're now having to kind of battle against them try to get those motherfuckers out because unfortunately they hold the keys to all the good venues or the only venues around sometimes they hold the keys to sometimes the infrastructure bits right some of them own all of the main audio visual companies you have to hire equipment from they're the ones that own some of the big booking agencies so you have to kind of interact with them in some way but they don't really click with what you're about so it's a hard situation to kind of remedy i think the only way to kind of sort it really which i'm thinking off the back of this is just to create your own thing kind of you know go fucking forget them and just build your own shit so almost like silicon valley style hey um we see a need in the world we see a want we're just gonna make the thing and kind of let it go from there and we're not gonna ask for permission we're just gonna ask for forgiveness that's what you have to do i'd imagine but again maybe it's easier said than done Let's continue. Let's continue. He stopped discussing events with me and booked more and more parties that apply to the old drinking men crowd, knowing it goes against everything that we've planned and agreed. Every time I would question it or want to discuss it, he'd make me feel ridiculous for even questioning it, saying that I would not know anything and that he knows the crowd of the club better than anyone. This is what they want, he said. This is despite the club was half empty most of the time. Do you know how criminal it is for a club that looks like this to be half empty? That is complete mismanagement of the people that own it. A club this beautiful in Watergate in Berlin, a club with all of these amazing views inside, both outside of the venue, to be half empty most weekends is a fucking travesty. This club should have lines around the fucking wazoo every single weekend. It should be the premier place to be. It should be maybe, there should be a situation where maybe this is the final boss of venues once you start making it in the fucking scene. This is where you kind of finally put your big, big party on to show that, yeah, this party is actually doing bits. But it's probably such a fucking toxic hellhole. It's got such a bad name around it that probably everybody in the Berlin scene knows to completely avoid it. I like it just architecturally and design wise because I've obviously, being a design school fucking graduate and shit, I obviously love this type of shit so i'm fucking in love with everything about it but i guess as a club as an institution but loads of people in berlin probably don't even go near it or don't touch it with a 10-foot barge pole so you have to give natalie a lot of credit for trying to you know bring this fucking behemoth of a club kicking and screaming into the 21st century but unfortunately the people that are there just don't give a fuck from what it seems like written in this statement it continues we were working in the completely opposite directions this is not the same colleague as i had in the beginning exactly because he wanted to fuck that's a thing it's annoying but this is the constant thing that uh, that happens in fucking nightlife i guess it's the drugs maybe it's the nightlife maybe it's just the fact that things happen after dark you know my parents always said nothing good happens after 9 p.m and unfortunately they're fucking right it really is a truth and it just is what it is unfortunately i think this guy wanted to fuck and that's why he got her the job i don't think he got the job because he actually believed in her abilities even though she's clearly good at her job based on what she she said i think he clearly wanted to fuck and obviously she turned him down and then he turned into a little bitch boy let's continue there was no chance to discuss anything and it left me wondering why i'm here every idea i had no matter how simple or beneficial it would be for the club it was against and it would be immediately dismissed it without any justification and valid reason or argument next slide um, eventually the queer parties I brought in at the beginning began to have issues despite everyone being on board initially then fitting perfectly with the plan changes everyone was super excited and these kind of events were coming to the club at first but then all of a sudden it was uh, decided that one of the biggest queer parties in Berlin doesn't quote unquote fit the vibe of the club so he went behind my back talked to all the other staff and made the decision to move it off the weekend slots when I heard about this I questioned him he said all the other long-standing members of the club agree my decision is final 
final what am i supposed to say to this you don't even involve me in the discussion about the event that i brought here so they undermine her they're icing her out this is textbook harassment abuse sort of behavior in the office right just because she decided not to be the office slag can you imagine you just want to do a good job put on fun events push the scene forward and eventually you know what was weird about it she's actually trying to help the club make money <laughs> she's actually trying to help these fucking old you know stuck in their way fucking guys make some money line their fucking pockets and guarantee that their kids go to fucking private school all fucking year round and they're fucking trying to cut her at her knees absolutely incredible you have to fucking love it and also this is proof that that whole thing that people were doing during covid about oh yeah we're gonna be more inclusive diverse venues we're gonna bring different voices black color white color all this sort of nonsense it was all performative because when people are put in position to actually try and make these changes or put these changes into action there's always opposition and when they don't need to do it and now there's not enough there's not much scrutiny on them there's not enough much as eyes on them the things that they were preaching and saying will change haven't changed have, haven't really changed nothing's really changed it's all the same shit again you just have to do things on your own and hope it gets better they continue negativity surrounding this one event continued and at one point i was pulled into a meeting because the staff had concerns one of which was what and i quote if the club will <laughs> oh my god this is one of my favorite segments right this shows you how fucking stuck in the mud and backwards this the dance music scene is the nightlife scene is the negativity surrounding this one event continued. At one point, I was pulled into a meeting because the staff had quote-unquote concerns, one of which was, and I quote, if the club will smell like assholes. Sometime later, the same event also made a very strong stance about Palestine conflict online, which again made it immediately subject to cancellation. So the members, the owners of this club were concerned that these flinter, queer, LGBTQ, gay rays, whatever they were putting on at this venue that were basically, at the moment, if you don't know nothing about nightlife, you should know that in most parts of like Europe, especially here in the UK, the LGBTQ flinter queer scene is the one that's the most popping. They've come and taken nightlife back by the fucking scruff of the fucking neck. They've fucking got a hold on most of the best parties. They've got the best vibes. They've got the best DJs, the best fucking fucking times you're gonna have at these events unfortunately if you don't like it it's up to you but that's the fact of the matter they are running shit at the moment so because they're running shit at the moment everybody's basically opened their doors to them because they're the ones that have the most captive audience they act they're fucking very enthusiastic very engaged they buy tickets early they attend the events all glammed up to the nines they make for good pictures make for good content make for good vibes all this malarkey is fucking brilliant right it's what you'd imagine the dream would be for any club manager or club owner to have this club full of like diverse people from all walks of life all fucking you know sexual orientations all fucking beliefs whatever may be raving under your roof fucking perfecto fucking perfecto fucking perfecto but with it comes a lot of very politically charged and active and socially aware people too who are maybe going to say things that you're probably not going to agree with because you know most of these people are like you know usually on the wrong side of history especially the owners of the club so these same people are putting on good nights but they're also saying free fucking palestine free fucking palestine until the fucking death and if you're somebody that owns these type of clubs who maybe has some leanings to israel you're not going to take it too well and you're going to cancel the event so it's a weird situation to be in at the moment um especially for the people that are putting on these parties because they're having to fight against this war right it's constant war because these guys unfortunately run they run the parties but the people that actually are in charge of the the, the main bits of infrastructure right they're the kind of deciding factors in places they're not going to go anywhere anytime soon because they refuse to leave as well by the way these 60 year old fucking club managers are like get out of the way bro anyway let's continue i had approached the bosses of the first time seeking some support and leadership for the force to work together one direction and while they seemed to listen they did absolutely nothing i was trying to be the bigger person and reach out to the other booker directly again to tell him i'm here and willing to work together as a team unfortunately since these talks the exclusionary behavior and bullying just became worse yeah exactly that's what it is it's exclusionary and bullying it's definitely bullying 100 percent what they're doing to it definitely i forgot that word definitely bullying he continued to fill the calendar without involving me often booking himself on lineups where he clearly didn't fit <laughs> that's what i need to do I, I think i was talking to um i think i was talking to becky streak about this on on the dms before a few weeks ago um big up becky streak big up fucking hot box right and i was telling them they're like i remember when i used to put on parties that was one of the things i did all the time when i used to put on raves i'd always put myself on the lineup but oh, mostly just opening opening fucking slots it was nothing crazy i would never give myself like a peak time set unless it was warranted of course but most of the time it would be like the graveyard shift so it would be like from nine to fucking 12 which if you know anywhere about you know any nightlife 
place you're in, Metropolitan City in the Western Hemisphere, you'll know that no one comes out to a nightclub before nine o'clock. So I'd be there at the clubs, right, playing at fucking 9 p.m. 9 p.m. on my own, playing random shit. <laughs> but it was good because I got to learn how to DJ because literally no one was there. But that was what I did. And I remember Becky Strick telling me, yeah, I did that too. So I thought, oh shit, what, well, this is not unique. Like she also, she's like, a, you know, she got one of the most popular and most fucking well-revered parties in London. And she's also, you know, putting on these parties, obviously to service her community. But also, hey, if I can book myself, <laughs> so imagine you, you, you work for a club like Watergate and you're booking yourself. That's, that's beyond... Imagine, I felt guilty about booking myself playing at fucking Alibi or playing at the Old Blue Last or playing at fucking, I don't know, um, Mixed Garage back in the day. This guy is a booker at Watergate and he's booking himself. That is, that's a that's a sackable offence, man. Especially if you're shit. Most likely he is shit, I'd imagine as well, with this type of attitude, right? Um... He continued to book himself even when he didn't fit. Of course, what else? I proposed to have a special women's... Oh my God, did you book yourself the Women's Day? I proposed to be have a special Women's Day event, but this was dismissed as not being important. Then... <laughs> these people are pieces of shit. Then this male DJ later had to cancel. The date was now free, so I was quite excited about putting together an all flinter lineup as I'd done in the previous year in another club, and it was very successful. However, I was not allowed to be involved at all. Imagine how it felt being the only female booker at the club, and I was not allowed to be involved in the world's women day event exactly instead the event was put together by a straight cis man the fact that i'm a woman more experienced or how successful my previous events were did not matter and i love that she said this i love that she said i'm a woman so i should have got to do that event but i'm also more successful in previous events and i had the experience like let me do the job because that i think is a main part which i love about this current crop of parties it's not like they're just doing it representation's sake which is important because we've all been bored and tired of the same fucking faces playing in the same fucking raves again and again i think i've actually got a picture here that way to show you where is it again i love all these people playing apart from jimmy jules but this is kind of the the kind of how it usually was when you went to raves right kind of you know this general like straight guys that would be playing i don't know i guess most of them are mixed two of them or three of them are mixed race only two white guys basically chris here clear dixon and me and seth troxler this is how it used to look right and these other people that are putting on these other events i purposely pushing other types of DJs, other types of, you know, people to play these events just to kind of mix things up again. But they're not just doing it for the sake of representation and inclusion. They're doing them because they're also fucking killer DJs. So I love the fact that she's saying, hey, even though I'm a woman, I should be involved in Wednesday events, of course. It's also because I actually do the job, which is the most important part. These people are coming in, they're putting on these great events like How, like fucking Inferno, all these type of events. They can clearly say, yes, we're inclusive. Yes, we're diverse. Yes, we're fucking very much in the times and in the zeitgeist. But we could also say we've got the stats to prove it that we move fucking tickets. We fill out fucking venues. We have great reviews, blah, 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 blah. It's all there in black and white too. So if you want us for the vibes, if you want us to fucking tick your fucking boxes and make you feel good about what you're doing for society, cool but when it comes to just the bare bones numbers and you know putting up those numbers and you know and looking up at the scoreboard we're also doing that as well so big up her for referencing that next slide on another day another male dj cancelled and i saw an opportunity to drive for the change of the plan so with a bike pock event which had a very extremely successful in the past sorry which has been extremely successful in the past this i guess i'm kind of bipoc in it am i bipoc maybe i'm kind of bipoc who knows am i bipoc or am i just pock who knows? Um, despite the fact artists had been confirmed for the party was later cancelled and the male booker gave the reason directly to the promoter saying, oh my God, I didn't see this bit. Said that they were too urban. This is the issue that I have with techno, with dance music and the club scene in general. I think I have this weird issue where like, for me personally, again, I don't really like to get behind flags and you know, whatever movements and put my fist up in here like I'm a Black Panther and stuff. It's not that serious. But I do find it a little bit annoying how, despite there being this collective kind of responsibility or collective push to promote and push like Flinter voices and BIPOC voices, it's mostly done to push people who aren't, you know, cis presenting in that regard, right? Or male. It's mostly done anyone but male that kind of flies under the BIPOC banner, we're going to push. But then I would say that I'm also not somebody that could be put in a male thing because 
no matter what party I go to, especially techno events, like you're always kind of being questioned about your in reasoning of being there, especially if you're not like in the club, if you're not like part of a cool, you know, group of people and shit. Because I usually go to these events by myself. I don't really talk about this stuff on social media unless I'm doing it on the podcast. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a thing I just enjoy like going to a gig. So I'm not like actively involved in the scene, but I am kind of in the scene, if you get what I mean. It's a bit of a weird thing. I like to do my own thing. But because I just turn up at these events just because I like to go there, you always kind of looked at a bit like, do you know what's really going on? It's like, of course I do. Why would I be at this random warehouse rave in the middle of fucking Hacky Week if I didn't know what it was about? But you're getting questioned because of the color of your skin and obviously your fucking gender. So people are looking at you like, oh, you're a black dude and you're a male. Like, what are you doing here? So even though I should be kind of in a safe space there, I'm not. But then I'm also seen as too urban when I'm not, you know, because I wouldn't describe myself as too urban. I know what they mean by too urban because they just don't, they, they don't want like overtly stereotypical black people at their events for some reason, which is odd, because I'd still say the most people that cause the most trouble at these events are people that look like themselves, right? It's not really even the fucking too urban people. So this idea that they're saying the too urban people are going to be the issue is fucking hilarious, especially if you've been to Watergate. You know, the majority of people that actually cause a, more, the most trouble on there, you know, are what people refer to as sun dodgers online. But again, what do I know? I also moved over um, on all. So I was also moved over on all the female queer BIPOC parties, which I'd worked on before. This party became the source of ridicule for the other booker, constantly making fun of them and their musical style. Despite having one very successful event at the club, this party also coincided because of the replacement with a male DJ headlining the event. So they basically don't want any blacks, don't want any queers, any gays any nothing they just want the same that's why Watergate is where it is isn't it so they purposely are pushing against this you know what's the thing called modernization or of like dance music and nightlife in general they don't want to be part of this new movement they just want to leave it and be as the same as it was before minimal until the end trance until the end well not trance trance is kind of trendy but i guess i get it i get it cool obviously i knew something was very wrong wrong here um after being bullied for weeks, I was close to giving up and somehow accepted this would be how it is here. The bosses weren't helping at all. Um, I'd already started to feel super worthless and question why I'm here, how I got myself in a situation and that allows myself to feel like this. Although I saw myself as a strong woman, at this point, I did not feel like a strong woman anymore. I've been beaten down over a number of weeks. I would come home from work depressed and wake up not wanting to go to work. In the morning, it was tough to work environment and there was no signs of it improving. It was also quite embarrassed about some of the events around the club side so to put out that I had no involvement in as it was quite opposite of what I came here for. I felt an incredible amount of guilt i had promised all the agents and DJs and promoters that the club was changing and brought all these new young diverse audiences with the promises that the safe space while i couldn't even keep myself safe here i question whether i was a part of it of the lie shit deep i wonder if she was a part of the people that got multi-sex to go to watergate or watergate or most has always been at watergate i wonder but yeah, that's what can happen when you're at a workplace, when you don't feel like you've been, you know, seen, you feel like you've been bullied and harassed. And I think there's nothing worse than being at a workplace that you're not enjoying your time there because you spend probably more time per week at work than you do probably with your friends and shit. So if you can't enjoy yourself at work, you probably need to go somewhere else very, very soon. And again, it's not about enjoying yourself, like finding your passion and shit. It's just not wanting to like, the, the feeling that you get when you don't want to go to work is probably a sign that you shouldn't be at the job that you're at. You probably should move sooner rather than later. As it happened on World Women's Day, I received another job offer. I was miserable at this point. I just wanted to take it and leave the situation behind. But at the same time, I didn't want to leave and give up. I love my job, but I wanted to escape the environment. My partner convinced me that I should try to talk to the boss's owners and tell them what really was going on with this whole time. Explain how I was feeling and hope to find a resolution and seeking support that's a bad move man it never works out that way it never <laughs> works out I'll guarantee that will never wherever you feel you should probably go by your gut and just move with it this whole clearing the air shit never works out in workplaces for me anyway m maybe my own experience is it but I feel like these uh, if you feel a certain way about your workplace very rarely you're speaking out about it it's going to sort it out you have to suck it up and just kind of ignore it and do your job and collect your paycheck or find another job but talking about it in the open with people doesn't do anything in my personal opinion we agreed to meet during which i explained all that was been going on one of the bosses remained silent unable to talk the other one responded by telling me to leave they fired me see what i mean about this <laughs> they fired me he said it's better for me to go oh my god there was no empathy no willingness to find a solution or understand he even started to point the finger at me for not integrating to the team and standing outside with the boys smoking or coming to a club alone on weekends to the old men parties that the club is known for. Firstly, I don't smoke. Secondly, this is a justification that or what went on there. Is there a requirement that I hang out with the boys while talking with girls they've slept with? 
You know what though? This is this is actually one of the unfortunate parts. This is actually one of the most unfortunate parts about working. And I think I've realized it the longer that I've been in the working environment. Working, unfortunately, is very rarely about how good you are at a job. It is mostly about how well you integrate with the team that you're in or with the company that you're in or maybe the team that you're in when you're working there at the fucking company. It's very rarely about how good you are at a job. That's why there are so many personality hires in most workplaces that are just there for the good vibes. They're just there because they always say yes to drinks on Wednesdays. They always, you know, they always say, they, they always say yes to quickly nipping out for a cigarette. They're always down for a fucking gossip or a chat on Slack or Teams and shit. That's what it's actually about. It's not really about how good you are at a job. That's why sometimes I think it's actually more embarrassing nowadays to get fired from jobs because it really does only require you to kind of play the game of like going to a couple of events after work going to a couple birthday parties hanging out after work to have some drinks at the desk and shit you know that's what it only requires but unfortunately in this regard natalie had every right not to be alone with these people because they made her feel uncomfortable because as a woman it's completely different especially being the only woman that's full-time working in the office full of lads who openly talk about fucking everybody they've worked with at work you know it's a different type of environment because you feel like they're almost because it feels like they're negatively reacting to her because she's making it very clear that she only wants to work and go home she wants to work improve the club make it a, a destination place to go to again you know do her job and go home but they don't want that they want her to be fully involved with everything that goes around them but she's like look i'm here to kind of give you a bit of my juice a bit of my sauce for lack of a better term but i'm not here to kind of give my all to a club because i've got my own life i've got my own scene my own community that i'm with cool but they didn't like that so that's probably why she got fired in that regard but this is incredible isn't it you want to clear the air you want to raise res resolution they're like no nah, get get out fuck off it's like jesus christ of all the outcomes i expected from this meeting this was not one of them i was completely shocked and speechless i came to them and told them i was being bullied and isolated for months in their club and this is their response he also made a point to tell me the person who had been bullying me would not be fired this is something i never asked for but he made sure to make it clear Oof. he also said i noticed you were feeling bad and i thought to myself you just let it continue Bearing in mind I'm a new girl in a club full of mostly straight men and you sit in the same office as me and don't think to take me to one side and ask me how I'm doing. As he left, he told me that he never parted ways with anyone on a bad note before and that he knows everyone in the city. I'm not sure if this was a threat, but that's what it said and it just added it to my anxiety. Yeah, that is definitely a threat. That's 100% a threat. That's definitely a fair feeling. Level. Again, these are the type of things where I think all men, all red-blooded straight men should have a list of things in their little book that they're willing to go to prison for they're willing to sit down in jail for they're willing to get handcuffed for they're willing to do some time for and i think one thing that i've got in my book of things that i'm willing to do some time for is obviously alongside of somebody physically harming my family in terms of my brothers my mom and dad and shit would be somebody touching my partner or saying something or making them feel away especially if it's a dude like I'm willing to do some time. Like I'm, I'm even close to saying to admitting in real life. Like I'm willing to do some time for fucking physically ab assaulting a woman if she touched my 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 lady or my partner, my wife. That's how much. That's how far I'd go. I think all men should have that in a list of like, hey, if this happened, if my woman came back home and said this, I'm willing to fucking put on a fucking banner clava, take my bat and go to the office and just start spanking people until you know there's fucking you know this fucking cherry juice all over the fucking roof that's what i'm willing to do like invincible style honestly because this is absolutely crazy bro imagine someone doing this to your missus and she's coming back crying every fucking night and you have it to deal with all this stuff and you're feeling fucking you know useless and shit fuck me anyway i felt like i'd gave them everything i had and now that i asked for something back which is the tiniest amount of support the only solution they come up with is to throw me out i felt like i was used and then they throw me away like some piece of garbage you dispose of and never think again since the meeting despite being promised that they would on, you know what's really even you know what's really sad about this by the way how cruel is this for michael reed she's at this place she's getting bullied they're harassing her they're making her feel uncomfortable sexual harassment bullying blah 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 in the midst of all of this she gets offered another job somewhere else but because she's so in what do you think called? i guess because she's so she feels like she can't give up and she feels like a calling to do whatever she feels like she wants to stay and prove it wrong and try and turn it around she then tries to have a clear the air talk and they fire her. So did she get that job back? <laughs> Do you know how cruel that world is? That you get another job, you turn it down, you stay the place you are, you want to make it work and then they fire you anyway. 
ain't that a fucking bitch? Since the meeting, despite being promised they would get in touch with me, no one spoke to me or for around a week. And the person who contacted me was a mail booker just to ask for a handover. Yo, that that mail booker guy was the he's the enemy of progress. That 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 mail booker is the enemy of progress. He's the real fucking sleeper agent. That guy, because he event he I'm I'm standing on it unless it comes out that he's fucking gay or something. I'm standing on the fact that he's the one I wanted to fuck first. He brought her in to kind of get her under his farm and to have her owe him a favor whatever it may be however dumb that is she turned down these advances or made it very clear she didn't want anything to do with them and then he completely turned 180 on her and it went to shit but that initial guy was though he's the real one he des he's the one you deserve to kind of get to get run over in a fucking fatal 500 in my opinion I had all my accounts and access deleted with no warning or discussion, even though I had still officially supposed to be employed for another month. All my emails were redirected and answered by one person that had bullied me. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. I had no chance of finishing any of the open projects I was working with and I'd been bullied and fired and he's a bully and he's a bully and benefits from it, backed up by the bosses. When I first started working at the club, I remembered a PRC employee there who had just been fired or let go. I was told that he was a drug-induced psychosis. After what happened to me, I looked, took some legal advice. One of the things the lawyer mentioned was that the calculated actions of the bosses sounds as though it was something that they had done before. So I reached out to this person. He told me he had been racially abused there for over years and upon approaching his bosses was not given any support or protection and was eventually forced out of the club. He was outraged at being painted as mentally unstable. Hearing this and the similarities to what I experienced, it really, mat it really made my understand sorry, that this is not just about me or him, it's about them. They don't care about diversi diversifying their team they don't value female voices they don't uphold white they uphold white cis hetero male patriarchy and that reflects your audience they attract i hope this goes to show you the insight into what it's like working behind the scenes as a young woman pushing for inclusivity diversity and acceptance in the berlin club scene which is weird isn't it i think what she said that is really informative and really powerful at the end this is the berlin club scene this is the scene that we all hold up on the fucking pedestal we all say it's the best scene, it's the most inclusive, it's the most diverse, most diverse, blah, blah, blah. But really behind the scenes, it's the same all around the world, especially in the Western, in Western world, especially here in the UK. People in the UK, myself included, sometimes can lord and suck up and lick up and suck the fucking dick of Berlin too much. But really, they're not that great. They have great clubs. They have amazing infrastructure in terms of being able to open long hours and shit. They take their job very seriously. That helps the club to be really good. And they have a high concentration of very talented people, artists, DJs, all working and all living and working in one fucking city. Cool. But really and truly, behind the scenes, the same issues that we're having in the UK, they're having over there. Sexual harassment, abuse, drugs, um, bullying, um discrimination blah blah, blah. it's all happening the same sort of thing it's just that maybe over there it's a bit more maybe over there it's a bit more like hush hush because the scene is so important it's such a part of their infrastructure there it's such a major part of their fucking economy and everyone wants to be a part of it that no one's willing to kind of step up and say something because they don't want to risk potentially harming their career whereas in london i feel like because everything is so shit here you don't really need to ask permission you don't really need to be a part of the scene it's actually not cool to be a part of the scene to be honest here in london i think maybe in berlin it's a bit more cool to be a part of the establishment here it's not so much because the establishment is what fabric like e e1 what fucking egg do you know what I mean like what's the establishment do you know what I mean that's th th those aren't great places so you kind of are forced to do your own thing because there's not the infrastructure set up to help you but then because of that when you do your own thing you do your own thing you have your own crowd you have your own way of doing things like as we've seen with the whole queer lgbt queer, um, gay scene that's popping up here in london they're completely doing their own thing their own way on their own terms and it's fucking working really well and now all those you know normal functions of the fucking scene or people are now reaching out to them and hoping they can come and give them some source right that's actually how it's fucking going so it's kind of nice to see that all these things are fucking changing in real fucking time right so big up everybody there um but yeah, sad situation all around. I wish it could have been a better situation, but I think what this shows well in conclusion is this. I feel like this is a classic indication that things are finally starting to get to a good place now. I feel like we're in a situation now where the scene is starting to kind of, I would say fix itself, but I feel like when these type of things happen, these are usually indications that the next phase is going to be great because it means that the 
the the establishment is sort of like crumbling under the pressure of all these new people coming in wanting demanding more and doing their own thing speaking power you know um speaking act speaking power into things and kind of trying to disrupt the kind of status quo and because of that eventually things are going to change and we're going to have new faces kind of being in charge but i feel like personally for me there should be less trying to be involved in the establishment and more doing your own thing fuck these motherfuckers you know what I mean? Fuck trying to fix Watergate, make your own Watergate and make it in the image of what you're trying to represent and who you're trying to push forward and the voices that you're trying to put on and the message you're trying to send to the world. Because I've always said, and again, this is a very soppy, gay, annoying, lame, idiotic, um, naive thing to say, almost Lex Friedman-like. But I've always thought as like club world, dance music, the nightlife as being like our attempt at utopia our attempt at designing and constructing our own utopia for like those brief hours, for those eight hours, 12 hours, 16 hours, we get a chance to take away all the differences that we have, all the things that kind of make us pit, pit, pit yourself against each other, all the things that make us feel like we're others and we're different and shit. We pull our differences to one side and we all kind of get underneath that roof and we rave and go fucking crazy and connect to this amazing music that we all kind of love from all walks of life. So if that's the case, that's what should always be the modus operandi, the main fucking focal point that we're all trying to aim towards. So why not try to do that now? It's, it's Again, it's hard to do so. It's not going to be easy, but why don't we give, give it a go? Because all these old motherfuckers, that's what it originally, if you look at the original origin, if you look at the origins of Ibiza and how that was set up and stuff, you'll see a lot of like very um, noble, almost altruistic, almost kind of like, you know, um, again, kind of trying to recreate your own uh, utopia type of vision over there until obviously it got corrupted by all the money and the greed and shit. But there was some people in there trying to do some great things and people probably they're trying to do some great things to this day. So I think that's possible to do so nowadays, especially with the infrastructure that we have, especially with the, so especially with the options and the tools you have available to you nowadays. You don't really need permission from the establishment anymore. You can kind of do your own thing and I feel like now is the time to do so. So more power to Natalie Patik. Um, obviously the story is fucking heartbreaking and obviously really, really horrible. But again, it's good to know that at least you know it's good to know that berlin isn't as perfect as it seems as on the outside especially as a quote-unquote tourist as i as as i am when i go there every other month and stuff i love the fucking place but it's good to know that they do have their own issues similar to what we have here and that in general you just have to create your own thing there is no like you know there is no like perfect situation where the industry is going to make it easier for you to kind of do whatever you want to do you kind of have to figure out your own way but unfortunately that is the long way and it kind of takes a lot more work to do it so big up Natalie Peck for fucking blowing that up there hopefully a resolution gets found out soon hopefully she lands on her feet and she's okay and it goes on and becomes absolutely amazing so big up Natalie Petit big up Natalie Petit we move on we move on we move fucking on cool what more to talk about I'm thinking, I'm thinking, talking about Berlin, there's this new club that's opened in Germany called Open Ground. And I've heard about it a few times, of course, on the Berlin, sub on the Berlin community subreddit and a few other places. I've heard people talk about it and refer to it as having the, one of the best sound systems they've ever heard. And I'm thinking of actually going to this place. And it's in this particular city called Wuppertal, which I think is next to Cologne and a few other cities over there in Germany. And I'm actually considering going there because, number one, the Airbnb prices. I've checked for the weekend um, for like a nice, decent apartment in the main city centre maybe like 150 euros 200 euros which is more similar to what i remember paying when i was going during my heyday of fucking going berlin every other month but that made it way more affordable because nowadays the prices and flights to go to berlin are pretty decent most weekends anywhere between like 40 euros to fucking 200 euros but the accommodation is like 300 euros for a weekend 400 it's like that's nearly half of my fucking rent do you know what i mean i can't be paying half my rent to spend a weekend in berlin that's too much so i'd much prefer to pay 150 euros 200 euros and I've seen some apartments at place or going for that kind of money. So I thought, you know what? Instead of just banging on the Berlin train and going for that ride, why not just go to a new place? So it's a new place. Um, this is an article from RA describing this club called Open Ground, um, which is open in Wuppertal. So it says a new club is opening in um, Northern Rhine, West Facilia, was that West Falia region of Germany, um, Germany, or Germany called uh, <laughs> located in Wuppertal. Open Ground occupies a converted bunker six meters underground. So that's where the direction of it is. 
close to the city's main train station. It's been opened by a team centering around the former Hardwax member, uh, Marcus Riedel. I think Riedel is how you say his name. Hardwax and founder called um, Mark Ernstens and also provides some consulting, which is amazing because if you know anything about Hardwax, it's like the premier uh, Berlin um, record store, um, great online store that I've purchased many things on there all the time. I'm always fucking checking out new releases on there. I fucking love everything about it. So you know primarily the sound's going to be incredible especially if it's opened by a team that were from the famed record store there the capacity is 1200 which i think is the perfect amount because i think that's spread across two rooms as well so i think one has got 200 one's got the thousand in it fucking incredible two room space focuses on sounds of music and ernestus will play covering the following monday so Open Ground also boasts a 32-inch bass Function 1 sound system and both rooms have been acutely designed for free field simulation. So here's some pictures that kind of give you an idea of where it is. I think that's a... Imagine, see, look, look how amazing things they've got in Germany when it comes to dance music. Look at this, bro. Look at this. Look at Super Jello saying accommodation equals uh, the, the fucking snow merge. I don't know what you're talking about, Super Jello. I have no idea what you're talking about. So <laughs> look at the location of, of the fucking venue. It's literally an underground bunker. There's a highway there and literally that's where the venue is down there. That's such an amazing... Because this, this is a thing that I love about Germany. They repurpose these places to have clubs. Whereas in the UK, this will be turned into a co-working space. They'll probably build a fucking stupid glass and metal fucking building and have more co-working spaces with a coffee shop underneath. Like, it's just fucking bullshit. At least you just say, leave it as is and let the club be built there for a number of times. That's fucking cool. I think they've taken out some of the bits on the inside so you can see how deep it is. And obviously, you've got a list of the events happening. Um, I actually went to check online to see what they actually got on here in terms of reviews from people, right? Because obviously people have been there to see what this club looks like because we've got no pictures on the inside because obviously it's a German club and they're not going to allow you to take pictures. But we do have some reviews here from people on Google that kind of give you an idea on what the club is about and what the vibe is, right? So let's kind of read some of these Google reviews regarding Open Ground. One of them says, what a night. What a surprise. It was not expecting anything when I came and my God was I well surprised. The sound system is by far the best I've ever experienced. The sound system is the best I've ever experienced. I need to go. Random club in fucking Whirlpool that everyone's fucking creaming over saying it's got the best sound ever. The staff and everyone in general are lovely. I'm not German and I felt included and welcome. The light show and the work and the overall ambiance um, match very well and there's a space where you can chill and sleep in which, in my opinion, is essential for a club. Yeah, that's very true. I think I, I think somebody mentioned that to me at fucking Hotbox. So big up Becky Struke and the team over there. They said that's one of the reasons why they love Hotbox because they actually have a good chill room. It's fucking really important to have areas where you can kind of just chill and do your own thing. And you don't need to kind of be raving all the time. I think in London, we don't really have that because clubs are only open for fucking six hours, four hours at most. There is no time to chill. They want they want to all force you into the dance floor. They want to get you next to the bar. They want to get you next to the toilet. They want you high. They want you drunk. They want you dancing. They don't want you to chill. There are no seats. There are no lounges. If you want to, if you want to sleep, go home. But here it's completely different. I recommend it 1000%. I'm sure you won't hear the last of it. Another guy says, um, best sound system I've ever heard. The bass is very crisp and clear. The acoustics are truly amazing. This is real chin stroker shit, right? This is real chin stroker shit. I love this stuff, man. I love when people are really geeky about m music and sound like this because I'm the same way. So it's good to see some brothers and, and sisters in arms. The club is very relaxed and has a very nice floor plan. There's a big outside smoking area and inside there is five to six chill spots. The bar is very efficient and the bathrooms where the cleanest I've ever been to. See, this is the kind of stuff that I describe. Uh, I, I go into detail describing fucking air conditioning units and people fucking take the piss out of me and call me an old fogey. But this is what I love. I love this shit. The bar is very efficient. <laughs> Efficient, the vibes and the music big up Mia, Mia Kudum crazy set where Immaculate situated right next to the train station it's totally worth the trip and there's a picture there that shows you a little bit of the inside we don't really get much of it but you see a little bit of the inside you see people queuing this is the stairs to go I guess into the main bit you probably get searched there and there's obviously people queuing there as well but what I kind of like about it is I'm not going to lie I kind of do like the mystery and the idea that all clubs in Berlin, all clubs in Germany, or all clubs in Europe for the most part, which is the good ones, they make you cover your phone because then it leads to you, guess what? Going there kind of blind. You have no idea what you're going to see when you get there. And then when you do see it, you kind of see it all with, for the first time with fresh eyes. So it kind of hits different. There's something beautiful about that. I'm not going to lie. As much as I want to know what it actually looks like, that, you know, 
in detail. I kind of like that. I'm going to see it all for myself, you know, when I'm there in person. Another person says, everything is done with love and you can feel it. The sound is probably the best I've ever heard in my lifetime. Insane. The attention to detail is very much on point. Another guy says, we purchased our tickets for the event online. Uh, oh, Jesus. This is a big review. Okay, let's read this one. This guy's here. Purchase purchased the tickets and events online with the hope that there would be a special ad entrance at the, at the, at the entry. That would quickly lead us into the warm atmosphere of the location. The door opened with a charming smile. We felt as if we were being ushered through an exclusive entrance at a secret location. At the ticket desk, we would not only receive a friendly explanation, but also the unexpected bonus of having our smartphone camera switched off out of respect for our privacy. Oh, they even make you switch it off. They don't make you just put the camera on. I fucking, you know what? It's a bit intrusive. It's a little bit nuts, but I kind of like it. I'm not going to lie. Turn your fucking phone off for a, a few hours if you don't mind. Go in there and fucking go crazy. Have a dance, have a drink, get talking to some people, have a good time and go home. Please, just for, I don't mind that because I, I remember when I went to the cinema to watch fucking, what's this thing called? Oppenheimer. That's one of the things that kind of annoyed me. Like you kept seeing random fucking glows, people's phones pop up and it almost took you out of the movie. Even though the movie was fucking incredible and an amazing cinematic experience. I'm so glad I watched it. Seeing people's phones light up randomly in the fucking cinema was fucking annoying. People just couldn't, people just can't leave their phones alone. Like in the cinemas, like just leave your phone in your fucking pocket. It's not that fucking serious. So I, I, I kind of like this. If they make you switch your phone off, not even put a camera, the sticker on it, switch it off. We then went straight into the cloakroom where they were pleasantly surprised to find the storage of our valuables was free of... Tr no way. A cloakroom is free. That's insane. I think Fold, even our most premier number one club here in London, they have a locker system. And I think you have to give them basically 15 pounds. I think it's like a five pound, it's like a five pound for the locker and then 10 pound deposit. And if you bring back the locker, you get back your £10 or something. So it's like £15 you have to shell out just to put your thing in a fucking locker. But obviously it's handy because you can go on the dance floor and fucking go crazy. But there's no such thing as free, as free fucking cloakrooms. Wow. Free cloakroom is fucking wild. The music playing for the inconspicuous sound loudspeakers immediately made us realise that something special was waiting for us here. Small banks of mitts, hazy light sources and inviting corners to relax in intensifies the musical journey. And our curiosity was piqued. A, a windy sorry um I, i'm getting winded now because i'm so so excited about going here a winding path led us through a labyrinth of sounds until we finally reached the main floor the acoustics that unfolded and exceeded all expectations for our venue of this size the sound was crystal clear every detail was audible and the volume was tuned so that it was neither overwhelming or distracting you know what this reminds me of this reminds me of the first time i ever went to berlin that's something that kind of blew my mind because I'm so used to fucking having a terrible sound system here in London, which is not terrible sound system. It's just like they're, they're kind of nerfed. They're kind of muzzled. They're kind of limited because local councils and shit are so strict when it comes to noise pollution. So that's why Fold is probably the exception because it's like in the middle of a industrial park where they used to, there's kind of like a bus garage there. There's delivery depots there. It's next to a train track. So that sort of like muffles a lot of the sound and it can kind of go crazy. But most venues in London, they're not allowed to put the sound up super high. And and that's why the noise is fucking shit. When you go to Berlin for the first time, you'll notice loads of venues, probably in America, you probably have that beauty as well. The that sound is incredible. But over there, they tune it so well that, especially in Bergheim, you can stand, You, I would not advise it, but you could go to the Bergheim main floor right in the center and have a full-blown conversation with your friend without shouting, even though it's really loud. So they tune it in such a way that it's super loud, but you can also hear your friend talking to you without having to go in their fucking ear. So this, this sounds exactly like that first time that I had over there. So I can't wait to go, man. Big up open ground. It was fascinating to observe how the experimental danceable structures transformed to artistic waveforms. The light sources in diffuse red tones, soft white created a captivating atmosphere and left us eager, 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 eager. It says here, um, see what's going after a few hours my evening was over but not without a pleasant surprise that the return journey went without a hitch despite a few detours due to the new construction of the Leverkusen Rhine Bridge the main railway station oh is that Leverkusen is that where Bayer Leverkusen is oh shit I might watch them football then as well if that's in the same area that's fucking cool just a 10 minute walk around proved to be extremely practical this location pleasantly surprised me and aroused my curiosity it excluded 
So it exudes an inviting atmosphere where every detail seems to have been carefully considered. A place that will be remembered, not just as a club, but as a unique discovery at Word Portal. I will definitely be back next Friday, eager to see the most positive surprise await me this time. Open your mind and you will feel it open ground. Yeah, that's a fucking good review. Big up this guy, man. What's his fucking name? Big up Marcus Funke or Marcus Funke. Absolute fucking incredible review. Absolutely love this. So I can't wait to go. Really, I'm happy excited infused to go because it's a new place it's fucking way cheaper to go to than fucking Ber Berghain and or Berlin sorry in particular and the lineup looks pretty sick let's actually see who they've got actually playing soon I'm actually thinking of maybe going in May I'm actually go check this place out in fucking May and see Wagwan oh look at this fucking lineup they had Fadi Mohan playing um they had oh DJ is that DJ Pete no DJ Pete was fingers yesterday and um Lady Machine um who else they have here that I remember they have Calibre who I'm a big fan of DJ Nigger Fox that's fucking sick um, who else they've got here uh, we've got Ski Mask we've got Ski Mask Zenka Brothers um, yeah this is this is the place I need to be at I need to fucking check this place out so definitely sometime in May maybe the beginning of May I may have to go check this out this fucking feels incredible I love the vibe about it I'm eager 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 to check it out let's just check this out they got a website for you they got a website as well to check out too nice art direction here I like what they're doing open ground loads of cool events happening very soon you got SPFs, you got Skeptics, Caliber playing, blah, you blah, see the pictures there. Let's check out their Instagram, what's going on in their fucking Instagram. I'm eager to check this out as well. Bloody blah, 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 blah. Let's see, yeah. Looks quite good, man. I like it. I like the space. Look at that. It's some good, good fucking lineups. Yeah, Lady Machine and DJ Pete. DJ Pete, I'm a big fan of, and a big up fucking... Um, and Paloma Bar as well, and Powerhouse, and big up fucking what's his name, Finn Johansson. Yeah, so DJ Pete out there with the Lady Machine, that was a probably sick banging lineup as well. So I'm eager to go, and I see some blacks as well involved there. So it's nice to see very much a change. Oh, big up my guy Rene Wise as well. Rene Wise is out there performing. Big up Ben UFO, he was out there too. Fucking solid, 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 solid lineups. I fucking love it. Definitely gonna check out Open Ground over there in Warpital. So I recommend you go and have a look as well of it because it looks fucking sick, bro. Warpital looks like a vibe open ground looks like a vibe new fresh places to go to so i'm eager to go check this out when it eventually happens oh look at this this is actually a review from the one and only lady machine what's she saying about it it's inspiring to see these kinds of spaces could exist and there are real passionate people behind it making things the best that they could be thank you to all the team for the warm welcome and the club tour in detail about the hard work that was put in to build this place i was in awe walking around an empty dance floor during sound check and realizing no matter where you were standing everything inside the room sounded the same wow i can't wait to go check this place out i'm so excited to see it every single detail was nailed in the space i had an amazing experience playing thank you for having me can't wait to go back yeah i need to check this out i need to go to fucking open ground lady machine has fucking sold it ra sold it with that fucking article ben ufo was there fadi moham is fucking there absolutely excited i can't wait to go i can't wait to fucking go let's fucking go anyways that has been it Agassino Zinger Show, episode number, what was it? Seven... 762 I think 762 thanks so much for tuning in Action episode number 6762 if you enjoy the show love what you see please make sure you smash the like button down below if you listen via the fucking podcast apps please make sure you leave me a 5 star review that would be so much appreciated just give me a 5 star review on any app that you fucking use don't be fucking stingy leave me a 5 star review you absolute lovely beautiful people who I love very very much if you listen to the podcast you will listen and hear a tune of the day playing underneath my voice right now if you're watching me via the live YouTube thing, you won't hear anything or fade to black. For all of you watching, there's going to be a random show happening right after this. So a random show in about 10 minutes. Tune in. Random show happening in 10 minutes. Random show happening in 10 minutes. We're going to go through the fucking new fucking fight in the kid with Jelly Roll. And we're also going to go through the new Chin vlog that's just dropped as well. So new fucking fight in the kid reaction. Chelly, Chelly, with Chelly vlog. Cherry vlog. Jelly, Jelly, Jelly Roll. Chelly vlog. Jelly Roll. And also a Chin fucking reaction happening right after this. So, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you so much. I'll see you guys in a bit. Love and blessings to you all. Thank you for being here with me. It's always a pleasure, never a fucking chore. And I'll gladly see you guys again in a few minutes. Take care. Be well. Bye.